It's October 3rd, 2022. This is a special edition of Rook. Well, hi there. Welcome to episode 203 of Rook and another special edition of our program. This one entitled The Uprising. Where the hell is the Western world? I'm Gian Gomeshi. Good to be with you, and I really hope you are doing your best wherever you are tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam Dustan Aziz. Durud Bashama. Where the hell is the Western world while Iranian youth are being killed? It's not just the media. Where the hell is the Western world? Oh, the outrageous silence of most of the Western mainstream media is important, as we first talked about in this space almost two weeks ago. That hasn't changed, but now it's bigger than that. Where is the world? Look, as many of you who are Iranian know, there continues to be a confluence of contradictory feelings inside us as we watch what is happening in Iran and those brave young souls putting their lives on the line for justice. There is elation and inspiration about their courage and drive for change. And there is devastation and pain in seeing the crackdowns on the protest and protesters by this murderous regime. But in all of this, there are events happening in Iran and the diaspora that by any measure or metric are occurrences that news outlets and governments should be responding to as priorities. Front page, big headline, lead the newscast, make the statement simple. On Saturday, half a million people marched around the world to draw attention to the uprising in Iran and this regime. We couldn't be more proud as Iranians in the West. Hell, that's bigger than the Live Aid concerts. But would you know it by turning on your cable news channel or scouring the front pages of the dailies? Would you know it in the pronouncements and presentations of Western governments? This weekend in Iran, a group of hundreds of university students at a top-notch institution were blockaded inside and systematically shot at, beaten, arrested, and detained by regime thugs. Can you even begin to imagine that happening anywhere in the Western world and not dominating the conversation and headlines for days or even weeks? A Canadian Prime Minister tweeting some soft policy changes, a French president meeting with Raisi, an American president waiting to sign a nuclear deal, European leaders talking about a few more little sanctions. Really? This is their response. And one is forced to search for reasons. Is it that we are Middle Eastern? Is it that we matter less because we look or sound different and have brown skin? Is it that somehow keeping this regime in power in Iran is helpful in having a convenient enemy to point to and blame things on. What happens in the minds of those Western leaders and so-called progressive voices who go on and on about social justice but are largely silent when it comes to basic human rights in Iran? Oh, there have been some outliers. Thank you, Roger Waters or J.K. Rowling for staying on this and saying the name Massa Amini more than once. But surely the West can do more. We're not talking about intervention, but attention that can support those on the ground in Iran and hobble this regime. If the time isn't now for governments, big companies, mainstream media in the West to stand up for human rights, when is it? We have another special edition of Rook today, this time themed on this very question, the uprising. Where the hell is the Western world? All right. Over the next uh, couple of hours, we're going to be joined by voices from across the diaspora on this special edition. Dr. Marisod Burjardi is going to be joining me, uh, the professor and author. Uh, he's in Los Angeles. Kahan London editor, Nazanin Ansari in London, England. Musician and activist Arash Sobhani in New York City. Actor and designer Armin Amiri is in L.A. And TV presenter and influencer Sheen Nasiri is also in London. Let me bring in the the Rook on Air team once again here in the studio. Smart Pega, hello. Hello. 
and Groovy Shaya. Hello, Hello to you. Hi, Aziza. All right. Dorastekeina goftam, this introduction, but let me, uh, and the title is Where the Hell is the, is the Western World, but let me start with some positives because I think there are some real positives for us to discuss and, mm-hmm. and, um, and experience and feel uh, right now. And we've been talking about this, I mean, 24-7, you know, <laughs> we were all scrolling through our news feeds and everything. I, I, I couldn't be more inspired today mm-hmm. as we're recording this mm-hmm. by watching videos of high school kids yes. in Iran. I, I've seen that. I don't know if I've ever seen something like this. Wow. Like Amazing. I, I, well, I guess we've seen high school kids here who are getting active now in yeah. in, the, in this but and and i was active in in high school but mm-hmm. these these brave kids yeah. did you saw the video of the yeah. mostly girls they're chasing out the superintendent the, the principal i think it something is. like yeah, that he's some bass he's yeah, like exactly. some, you know and it's just like a, a movie uh, yeah you it know? Was, i was going to say it was like a happy ending of a disney cartoon <laughs> like, I, I mean it's just the i mean the collective awareness mm-hmm. of these young high school students in Iran going up against their superintendent, their principal, surely knowing, surely knowing there could be consequences yeah. and somehow understanding like wisdom gained through centuries of revolutions, you know, <laughs> or, you know, uprisings that the collective are stronger than the, you know, I mean, the, oh, together yeah. we are strong. So yeah. there's like a bunch of them together. It's just Incredible! Yes. They're, you know, these are children of the revolution. Yeah. Yes. They were born in the 21st century into an Islamic Republic of Iran. Mm-hmm. And there they are, fuck you, you yes. know, taking off their hijabs, yeah. ch- ch- chasing the guy down, going, no, we're not going to stand for this anymore. Yeah. I mean, amazing. wow. The, yeah. the right? photos as well. There was a photo I saw circulating online. Um, it's a, a bunch of high school girls, and they've removed the photo of the supreme leader and instead put a piece of cardboard. Yes. That, yes. And on it, they've written Zan Zendigi Azadi. Yes. And um, they, they're standing in front of it, and they all have their middle finger up. <laughs> and it's their backs. And that photo, I was just... Hey, I told her, leave them kids alone. That's right. Yeah. Well, so that's a moment of, of positive. But also, you know, we're all coming off a weekend where... Uh, obviously, we're going to get into the, the Sharif University and some some of the things that are less positive that we've been um, experiencing and looking at over the, the last couple of days. But um, but you know, for those for the three of us and for many people listening um, around the world, this weekend was a week of collective action outside of Iran yes. as well. And the three of us being in Toronto here and up mm-hmm. in Richmond Hill mm-hmm. attending that protest. Um, you know, I mean, I I grew up here. I've been uh, was an activist for many years doing things. I, I, I you know, you hope for a, a couple thousand people at a good demo, mm-hmm, you know, an yeah. anti-war demo or something. <laughs> I mean, um, fifty thousand plus. Yes. Who knows how many more it could mm-hmm. have been? But because surely it was at least fifty thousand. Um, and united, like at one point, I'm walking and and. There's like the guys from the Communist Party walking by, right. and me, and the and monarchists on the other side, and I'm kind of thinking, well, this is new, you know, yes. where nobody's yelling at each other for yeah. one day, and we're all, you know, headed to the same place and yeah. and chanting the same name, yes. Masai Amini, and and uh, a pretty remarkable day. Yeah. I was just taken aback, not by just the sheer number of people there, but exactly what you said. I think there was just this common feeling and you know everywhere you looked it was like you didn't even have to talk to people just looking at each other you knew that everyone was there for the same reason yeah. everyone felt the same there and yeah. it was highly emotional i mean there was a point towards the end where i just i mean i lost it i couldn't even control myself i had tears coming down my face i just yeah. i was so taken aback by everything that we had just gone through the last couple yeah. of hours that we had been there and it was just, I mean, even now talking about it, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps. You know, sometimes people use the language of like activism or something and say, my sisters and brothers, our brothers and mm-hmm. sisters. You know, but it really, f- that's yeah. that's an occasion where you feel that, right? That's right. You yeah. sort of go, all of these people, uh, and, uh, you know, there were even some chants like, hey, if you're running and you're not walking with us, come walk with us. Mm-hmm. You know, there was that that kind of thing where it just, it, it felt a lot of unity. I mean, other than the fact that Shia avoided us, <laughs> it felt like real unity. Yeah. <laughs> I came with a couple of my Canadian friends. Yes. And also, it's interesting, I didn't tell them. They knew of this rally and they mm. uh, 
reached out to me and they wanted to join us. What was their impression? Oh, they couldn't believe it. You know, mm. it was mm-hmm. massive. Like it yeah. was huge, huge, and they were shocked. They, and I was really proud. You know that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, this is us. And just a couple of of snapshots from the day. I mean, uh, um, you know, this was happening around the world, and we'll talk to a couple of people who, uh, I mean, uh, I know Armin Amiri, and mm-hmm. I think actually Dr. Burj ID was at the, they were at the Los Angeles protests. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm guessing Nazanin and Shirin were in London. Um, uh, I know Arsh Sopani was in New York, so we'll get a snapshot of everywhere. But in our case, I mean, there's just a few things that, um, first of all, uh, we were... I guess lucky enough to have Hamid Ismail Yoon speak at um, in Toronto, who's um, one of the main organizers, you yes. know. And everybody, I don't need to, need to explain at this point who he is. Yeah. And this is the 203rd edition of Rook, and on the number one number edition of Rook, the first uh, episode we ever did, he was our guest. So if you listen to this show, you probably know who he is, we should hope. But I thought he was spectacular. Oh. In, 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 I mean, we don't, uh, there's no official leader of the opposition in, uh, in Iran or in the diaspora, but Hamid's certainly one of them. I mean, he's, yes. uh, he is just, um, he's got the pedigree, he's got the background. We all know he's, tragically what's happened mm-hmm. with his family and just the, the poetry and the passion with which he speaks mm-hmm. um, was amazing. Uh, the other thing I, I wanted to just mention, because we'd be remiss if we didn't, the Shervin song. Oh. Now, yeah. everybody who's listening who has anything to do with being Iranian <laughs> knows the Sherevin song, yeah. Baraya, at this point. But, uh, Shaya, you and I were talking about, I mean, uh, there was a couple of moments at this demonstration uh-huh. where there were, I mean, the, towards the, at the actually, the towards end of the, the speeches, end. they played the song, because they were playing it throughout, yeah. and everyone's singing along, mm. yeah. and I know that that was happening around the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, you see, like, there's a protest in Fra- Frankfurt, and they're singing that song, you know. And think about this moment in history, this this weird collision of things that's happened, which is, you know, um, an uprising in Iran that has inspired the diaspora. A kid writes this song, you know, it's a genius song using tweet lyrics. A kid gets arrested, which the song has gone viral, it goes double viral. There's probably no Iranian in the world, mm-hmm. you know, at least anyone who's got some social conscience or aware or whatever, you know, that doesn't know this song mm-hmm. and is singing along to it and it didn't exist a week ago. <laughs> yes. yeah. I mean, that's that's the 21st century. Yes. The song didn't exist, yes. you know, or maybe a week and a half ago, right? I don't know when he wrote it, but he recorded like last week or something. Mm-hmm. I mean, what you're saying about um, this being the same across different cities and, and from one end of the world to the other. I was talking to uh, my best friend who lives in Boston and I was telling her, you know, yeah, on Saturday, this is how the, the demonstration went and how was it in Boston? We were just kind of comparing notes, so to speak. And um, I was telling her, I said, yeah, I got really emotional at the end because they played this song and the sheer number of people and that overwhelming sense of pride and support mm. and mm. unity and all of that. And, she's, and she kind of started laughing. I said, why are you laughing? She said, yeah, the same thing in yeah. Boston. Yeah. You know, the same mm-hmm. thing happened. And it's, it's crazy to think that we all had this shared experience yeah. across the globe. Yeah. And it's something, look, I, great pieces of art. That that song is real simple, mm-hmm. yes. you know, but uh, but uh, you know, I, I, I'm definitely not alone in saying this. On the 100th listen of that song, it still can make me cry. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just exactly. something about the way that it was created, mm-hmm. yeah. the the lyrics, the way he sings it, and what it means now, yeah. which transcends everything. I mm-hmm. mean, it's especially at the end when he says mm-hmm. Yeah, when he goes off. Yeah, yeah, he goes to the falsetto. Yeah. Uh, so someone sent me a link, link that, uh, like, uh, ju- uh, said Osimo, the national TV in yeah. Iran. Actually, they made another version of Baro, yeah. But, <laughs> wow. but, yeah, but it was so funny. Wait a minute. That's the, isn't that the, that they can't play Baro, yeah? No, no, they, they can't play Baro, yeah, but, like, they changed the thing, like, Baro, yeah, Ayatollah, Bahjad. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> Oh my god. Wow. It was funny. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I will send it. Oh please, yeah. God. Well, and by the way, I mean in the interim it's kind of we don't know we don't know what's happening with Sherman, right? He's been arrested and actually his uh, his, his friend okay, well. um posted a video today. Um and there was some 
I mean, there's there's all this conversation surrounding it, but uh, he his friend, or I, I guess they, they work together on music. I'm not sure who this gentleman is, but um, he came and he said that uh, I need to clarify a couple of things. We've, you know, heard bits and pieces, and um, I just want to let you all know that nobody detained Shervin. He oh. actually went himself after he received oh, okay. a phone call asking to be to come in or something along those lines. And so now a lot of people are saying, well, what's this video about? Is is this individual under pressure to say this or mm-hmm. is this for real? Okay. okay. Yeah, let's wait and see what yeah. uh, where this is all going. But uh, also, Shervin's Instagram has disappeared from mm-hmm. what I heard. So uh, I don't think that's voluntary on Shervin's yeah. part. <laughs> uh, I've decided to, you know, disappear. I don't uh, think that's a... Uh, it's yes yeah and also, and also i wanted to say that they arrested sirvan khosravi yes. and zanyar khosravi they explain uh, yeah they, they are the like a very famous uh, musician in iran and like brian adams actually uh, tweeted yes he that did that's yeah. right yeah and so yeah it's it's really like ridiculous that yeah and that's arrested. the that's the flip side of where things are at mm-hmm. Let, before we get there just one more thing about the rally sure. for those who are listening in canada um, the opposition in Canada, the official opposition party in Canada, is the Conservative Party because mm-hmm. the Liberals mm-hmm. are in power. The Prime Minister is Justin Trudeau. He's a Liberal. This I'm explaining this for non-Canadians <laughs> because Canadians are like, "What the? F- why are you telling us this?" Um, and Trudeau, you know, I mean, the Liberal Party is ostensibly sort of the Progressive Party, uh, along with the NDP. But uh, Trudeau has been really uh, well. There's certainly people like the families of Flight 752 who've been uh, who feel like Canada hasn't taken enough action to, at times, and it, Trudeau hasn't looked good in the last couple of weeks in terms of putting out a tweet mm-hmm. and not really taking much action. There's a little bit of action today. We can, we'll talk about that in a moment. But but the, so there's these speeches in front of the thousands of people in Toronto, and uh, the guy's hosting happens to be a guy we had on the show last week, uh, Kavish Shahruz. I didn't know he was going to host mm-hmm. it. Says um, we invited Justin Trudeau to uh, come, the, we invited the Prime Minister, and we haven't heard back. Mm-hmm. And the crowd started booing. Mm-hmm. And then, but but uh, actually, the leader of the Conservative Party is here. This Pierre Poilievre, you know, he's the new, newly minted uh, head of the Conservative Party. And whatever you think about him, I don't actually know enough. Mm-hmm. I know some of his policies might not be my bag or whatever, but, but this guy and the people around him knows how to read the room. Definitely. Right? He, I mean, they, he got up there and said all of the things that the crowd wanted to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to stop, you know, regime money coming into Canada. We need to put the IRGC on the terrorist list. Uh, and it was like, wow, why can't our government do this? Yeah. Why is it, why is the opposition leader, I mean, this is a, you know, if, if the Iranian community in, in Toronto or maybe even in Canada, isn't running in droves to the conservative party now i'd be surprised mm-hmm. because that was uh um i miss hopefully it's coming from a real place in in but whether it is or not it was a really smart political move yeah i mean i was listening to him um give that speech and that's all that was going through my head i was thinking you know I think for a lot of Iranians, they'll be a lot more lenient on whatever his policies are just because of the support here. And he's been consistent, like in the House of Commons, mm-hmm. they, you know, they, they, you know, he's he, uh, anyway. Uh, so so uh, one of the big winners of the weekend, uh, uh, it's like Roger Waters, like the, uh, amongst the non-Iranians that are winning the people's hearts. Uh, uh, weirdly enough, the conservative, the conservative. new conservative leader who's uh, a right wing guy doesn't quite look Persian, but uh has become an honorary Persian based on his policies uh, and some of his um, his team members who were up there. Okay, so um, on the other side is the basically with the theme of what we're talking about uh, today, which is uh, where so there's this stuff happening that we are inspired by, um, and at the same time, um, man, I mean, I you know as big as that was in Toronto. Uh, and and as cynical as I like, I made the video two weeks ago. Where's the mainstream media? Mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, I, I've got no rose colored glasses <laughs> around this stuff. I couldn't believe yesterday yeah. going through the news, Nothing. trying to find any word of this, Man. like a little article here and there, an article that tangentially mentioned there was a protest, by the way, in Toronto as well. This is, I mean, forget the Iranian community. This is a huge event in Toronto. Nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. If you didn't, if you're not on 
Persian social media and you know on all of our Instagram and mm -hmm. WhatsApp feeds that we're getting all everything sent to us. Would you know that there was twenty five thousand people in L.A.? Nope. nope, nope, not anywhere. Would you know that there was a massive crowd, disproportionately massive given the population there in New York, and so on and so on and so on, right around the world? Really weird, yeah. really weird. And as I said in the intro, between that and the seeming quiescence of of you know governments and leaders around the mm -hmm. world who kind of you know almost feels like like today there was some action and it feels like they've been goaded into okay exactly. i gotta make a statement biden made a statement and it, but it's weird yes. right i mean if this was happening somewhere else this sheriff yeah. university thing yesterday you want to describe what happened yesterday for people who i mean in case somebody hasn't been you know <laughs> I mean, glued to their you know new news feed in in social media the simplest of ways that i can put it is to compare and say it's as if um hypothetically a university like harvard or mit was all of a sudden stormed by some sort of I don't know, guerrilla army or something along those sorts. With the students inside. With the students inside. A state-sponsored guerrilla army, yes. army, right? Yeah. Students are, are basically blockaded inside. And, and I mean, just that alone, without even going any further, that would be news, breaking news across the world yeah. for days and days on end. And nothing. I mean, th this is happening right now in Iran, and we have no coverage i mean yeah there's if you're on persian twitter or if you have an iranian friend who posts something sure you might have seen something coming out of you know their instagram posts and shares and and tweets coming outside of or coming from iran mm. but that's it no no global coverage no breaking Forget news the coverage where, what, where's the where are these the, the, the leaders. these leaders who yeah. are so involved Nothing. in human rights Nothing. and you and know you don't want to come out and say oh my god mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i mean uh, like i say there's been now there's been a couple of tweets today and stuff um, uh, and it just feels like some policy advisor is going, uh, sir, you should probably say something, <laughs> yeah, you know, but yeah. uh, it's, uh, I, I just feel like the reaction would be more visceral mm -hmm. somewhere else in the world. I mean, we know Iran's not the most popular place in the world still, and, and any Iranians, there's stereotypes, there's negative generalizations mm -hmm. and stuff. Maybe that plays into it, but you kind of have this, I don't know, this illusion maybe that because the Iranian diaspora is so educated and, you know, contributes so much as in immigrant communities in places like Canada and the U.S. and England that that will be valued, mm -hmm. you know. And, and <clears throat> that's the thing. That's why it's so hard not to be disappointed when you see the lack of attention to, to what's going on. I mean, if you were to compare it to other global conflicts and I don't know, let's talk about the most recent Russia-Ukraine conflict, yeah. for example. Um, I was actually so upset about this that I wanted to take a look at it and see if there was any statistics on this and sure enough I found that um, there was recently a study done by Reuters Institute and so what they did was um, <clears throat> they did a poll across five different countries US, UK, Germany, Poland and Brazil and asked the general public if they felt uh, that the media was doing a good job of staying up to date with the conflict mm. and 47 to 65 percent of the population in those five countries said that they felt the media was doing a good job and when I look at that and mm. I compare that to what's going on right now with Iran and the lack of attention, mm. the lack of coverage and just imagining what it would be like to talk to the Iranian diaspora mm. and ask them that same question about what's going on in Iran. No, I, I like, first of all, they're, they're different. Let's 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 uh, put it out there in case somebody comes and says, "Well, <laughs> Russia launched a war and has nuclear weapons. Well, yeah, OK, we, you know, but but we're talking about a global a crisis some happening somewhere in the world that's yeah. leading to the loss of mass amounts of life and, and of the lives. crackdown and all that uh, uh yeah i like i know because of watching the news and for the last few months i know different regions of ukraine i can recount all kinds mm -hmm. of speeches from zelensky yeah. you know i know inspirational moments i know when they pushed back in kiev and then i know to say kiev instead of kiev i know <laughs> you know i mean i know a lot and yeah. i should we should good good yes. you know we should and i want to hear more about what's happening in russia and i want to and 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 that's really great um but yeah i mean if we were getting 20 percent of the coverage of exactly. ukraine i would be thrilled mm -hmm. uh you know or 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 the kind of global and the thing is is that you know Global leaders can set agendas, right? I mean, and, and and 
you know, so can big corporations. Mm-hmm. I mean, if 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 you know, the the heads of major corporations and and influential leaders around the world started going. The most important thing right now is there's a dictator named Khamenei, and this guy is slaughtering students. I, you know, the world would be waking up to this. It's that's simply not happening, right? I Sorry, I stepped on your statistic. Do you have <laughs> no, more statistics? No, no, no. That All was right. that was the big one. Um, but yeah, I mean, in reference to what you just said, even the universities, I think you know, and, and I know there was that big call to academics and the academic community today um, to really step up. And I think you know, I mean, I hope we start to see that coming out of at least the universities. What do you make of this, Shia? About the media or the Sharif Both. thing? No, well, I- anything that okay. we're talking about. Yeah, uh, I, I want to say, like, uh, the Sharif incident, unfortunately, you know, it happens a lot in Iran. Like, I, I when I was in university, I've experienced several times that, like, Basij attacked. We really, we, we get scared. Like, what the hell? What was happening mm. here? But this time, the difference this time is, like, uh, they literally shoot at them you know and it like it's as an i'm not sure anyone was killed but with their, the shots were heard mm-hmm. yeah definitely people beaten definitely people arrested definitely people atta- detained mm-hmm. yeah definitely people freaked out and running and you know yeah. um it's so we don't know that we don't know we don't know yeah. if people work it we yeah. don't know the but it's a very scary situation i mean because i've experienced like not this but like uh, yeah. less than this it was really a scary situation uh, like you get hostage in university and they attack you. So, so today again, just to, in case we're you know uh, accused of not uh, by by some government <laughs> leader that you know. So today the European some some governments in in Europe are talking about are proposing sanctions. Additional sanctions. Yeah. Um, Biden made a speech, uh, put out a statement. Yes, Biden put out a statement after right. 17 days, I think. Mm. Well, and he said something in the middle of that speech last week, like, oh, yeah. and by the way, you know, Iran. Yeah, yeah. this is his official statement. Okay. Um, and it came from the White House. And I thought, you know, I actually saw it first on Persian Twitter, right. <laughs> obviously. Um, and so I went looking for it, thinking, well, okay, th- let's see, where's the press release? Where's the information about right. it? And for the president of the United States to make a statement and for someone to have to go digging for it. I mean, <laughs> right. how, how Well, maybe is it that? hasn't made it through to the, the wires yet. I mean, yeah, it's, maybe. We don't have the, the, the carrier pigeons haven't dropped it off to the... Something, something like that. It must be. The thing it, is great that he made a statement. Yeah. Great that we, you know, we need that. Thank you. But, but um, I, f- I do fear that that's something that the Iranian community will... Like we'll all, you know, people pass it along to each other in in, in Persian Twitter, and the the broader community doesn't. Yeah. Well, well, that's exactly what I was getting at. I mean, you know, I saw it immediately on Persian Twitter, but then when I went to go look for it online and and go through, you know, other media outlets and and, yeah. and see where you know if anyone else had looked at this or made a comment about it or anything, nothing. Yeah. I mean, I had to go. I went through all of the the um, White House channels, so like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all of that. Nothing. Oh, it's, it's not no, there. No, it's not. It, it wasn't on mm. any of those right, when it was right. initially released. I don't know if it is right, now, right, right, right. but um, yeah. And and in Canada, um, the Canadian government has announced uh, some more sanctions. Mm-hmm. Uh, sanctions on some individuals, and sa- they, they've sanctioned now the IRGC. That's right. Again, hard to know exactly the details of how that plays out and whether it can be enforced and how it's enforced and whatever. Um, and I immediately texted some people I know who work in lobby groups and policy and, and stuff like that and who've been trying to move the ball along to mm-hmm. get Iran uh, on the agenda and stuff. And they said, uh, nobody who really wants action on Iran thinks that this is enough. Um, that this is just kind of a uh, a little bone that's been thrown, okay, but mm-hmm. uh, it doesn't it doesn't really address what needs to be done. I mean, at this point, I I want to stay hopeful and I want to not look at things so cynically. So I flip flop between you know looking at these tweets and and raging with anger and you know going back to myself and saying, well, it, it's potentially a step forward. But it, it's hard to keep that hope because, I mean, 17 days in and now you've got the president of the United States putting out a statement that's in the depths of the online community somewhere. Yeah. Like, 
Well, look, what we hope to do here is, yes, uh, everyone's scrolling through Instagram and TikTok and whatever and mm-hmm. getting little uh, tidbits of stuff and talking points that get shared over and over again by different influencers or whatever. Uh, we're going to try and have some uh, deeper conversations around this question mm-hmm. and from, di- again, different voices in the diaspora in English here uh, in the hopes that um, we can add and amplify the conversation. Mm-hmm. So uh, I invite you guys who are listening right now, stick around because uh, our Sobhani coming up in New York, Nazani Ansari in, in London, uh, Armin Amari in LA, Shiri Nasri in London. But um, let's go first to uh, Pega and, and Shai C on the other side. Sure. Let's go to our first guest who is, uh, is we got him? Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. So our first, I have to find my own introduction here. Our first guest is Dr. Mehrsad Burajardi. Uh, we're going to go to Los Angeles. He's an internationally recognized expert on Iran and Middle Eastern politics. He's the vice provost and dean of the College of Arts, Sciences, and Education at Missouri University of Science and Technology. Dr. Burajardi is the author of two books uh, entitled Post-Revolutionary Iran, A Political Handbook, and Iranian Intellectuals in the West, Tormented Triumph of Nativism. He's a regular presence on media outlets such as Al Jazeera, uh, Associated Press, The Economist, The Guardian, NPR, as well as New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post, and more. Right now, Dr. Mehrsad Burjardi joins me from Los Angeles. Hello, sir. Hello, Jan. Thanks for having me. Good to have you back on the show. It's interesting times. You know, I was thinking about someone like you and 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 your your life and your job is to write about things and sometimes they can feel you, you know hypothetical almost. You you game out situations that may exist and as I said in a, a video that that I made a couple of weeks ago, there's nothing really hypothetical about this anymore, is there? This is uh this is quite something that you're that we're witnessing. Absolutely. I think this is really an uh, unprecedented um, event in the history of the post-revolutionary Iran. We are seeing certain uh, features of this movement that we have really never seen uh, you know, before. So, for example, uh, the fact that um, uh, this uh, display of unity between Iranians inside and outside the country as manifested in the demonstrations that took place a couple of days ago in uh, over 150 locations throughout the world, I think demonstrated that uh, you know Iranians really are aspiring for the same thing regardless of the factor of geography. Um, the fact that these you know protests are happening in the four corners of the country uh, has really put to rest, for me at least, you know, all those fears about, um, oh, you know, a massive protest in Iran might lead to the disintegration of the country. You are seeing, you know, uh, protests in uh, places like, you know, Kurdistan or Sistan and Baluchistan, and everybody is basically, you know, reading from the same script, right? It's uh, the same type of demands are being articulated. So I think that's really a major boost to a lot of uh, us who have been, you know, um, uh, following Iran's, you know, uh, history of protest movements. Uh, the other thing that, frankly, uh, has been um, warming my heart, and I think those of many others, is, is the primacy of women's rights, you know, in this whole movement and their rather impressive um, presence, you know, in, in the streets. So uh, it might be a still a bit premature, but maybe, you know, we should be starting talking about a turning point. Mm. In, in terms of women's rights and, you know, particularly the issue of, of hijab uh, 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 moving forward. Well, uh, well, I, well, let me take those to, well, one at a time. The, the first, in terms of this time being different, you know, there is, there is kind of a, um, a narrative that says, uh, okay, well, we've seen protests, demonstrations, uprest, uh, 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 uprisings in Iran, um, especially in the last 20 years, uh, the student protests of 99, the, the Green Movement in 2009, um, Aubon 2019, uh, the reaction to the Flight 752. This is another one, another point, and, and each time they grow bigger or more um, more angry, etc. Um, 
then there's a school of thought that says, that, no, no, this is different this time. And and um, people are talk, saying some of the things you just said in terms of the, the widespread nature of it, the, 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 the nature of how uh, uh, it seems like there's different classes uh, involved this time. There's uh, different mm-hmm. folks, different ethnic groups involved. Do you feel that? Do you feel that this... Uh, in contradistinction to what we've seen up until now is is a different thing okay so let me elaborate a bit on on this really wonderful question uh, look i think the for me the 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 issue is the following we are dealing with uh, a the, the the current regime in iran is dealing with uh, what i call it you know uh, demographic problem by that i mean the following you know they do not really have any convincing arguments to win over a population that is young, educated, urban, and wired, right? Mm -hmm. People who are technologically savvy. So we have, you know, a generation of, you know, folks, uh, men in their 80s, uh, and so making decisions for this type of population. And, you know, it's this same old cliches that they have been offering for over four decades. So naturally, what we are seeing, you know, right now in the streets of Iranian cities is that that 20 and 30 year old generation is showing that they are totally alienated from the educational system, from the propaganda machinery of the regime, and that, you know, gradually they have become more and more daring, right? So uh, you mentioned the, the protest of 2009. Uh, as as we recall, you know, back then, the protest uh, that was often happening in, in a silent fashion was, where is my vote? Right. right? So it was a question about, uh, you know, electoral uh, irregularities and, and cheating in that sense. Nowadays, what we are hearing is a much more radicalized uh, message coming from uh, these young generation, right? And they are saying, we don't want the regime. So we have, we have moved you know in 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 terms of radicalization of the of the demands yeah and yet and yet i want to offer a cautionary note i don't think false radicalism is really what we want right i think we need to be mindful of certain facts Uh, i disagree with colleagues who who think iran is on the verge of a revolution i don't see that frankly you don't look I don't, and I and I explain why. As a student of, you know, comparative politics, when I look at revolutionary situations around the world, there are certain prerequisites. There are certain things that need to happen, which we still do not see in Iran, and therefore makes me reluctant mm. to label the current situation as as a revolutionary moment. For example, you know, in in every revolution that I know of we see there is a process of defection by certain segments of the establishment who come to the opposition, right? right? Um, We do not see that type of, uh, you know, mass defections. And I'm not talking about, you know, a few souls, Mm. you know, uh, lonely soldiers here and there. Um, We do not see that type of a defection. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Exactly. Right. Not yet. So, you know, I want to see defections from the military establishment, from the clerical class, from the bazaar merchants, and so forth and so on. And that's not there. So here, I think it's a very important issue for us, you know, in the opposition to think about, right, how radical should the message be? Are we going to really leave room for defection? so that people can see that they are not cornered, mm. that, you know, you can forget and forgive, as has happened in places like, you know, South Africa and others. Or we are going to say, no, we are going to be hanging you, you know, by the neck because of your past affiliation with the regime. I think that's the wrong message. Mm. Uh, you know, it's the same phenomena as You, you understand the anger, obviously. but Absolutely. Yeah. No, and I think that's really where... The, the dilemma comes into the place. People are rightfully angry, right? People are rightfully angry. But I think the question that, you know, uh, people who are thinking strategically about the future of this movement need to be asking themselves is, okay, you know, do we want to just have manifestations of raw 
anger mm. or do we want to you know lead this protest movement into you know a, a, a positive right. change with the least amount of violence you know bloodshed uh, that that is possible why do you call right? why do you call that false radicalism why isn't that just radicalism right because i think you know right now again the anger has led to a lot of you know uh, radical you know sentiments in the in the in the country but and, and i think you know for example i see this with a lot of media expatriate media etc that has become sort of an echo chamber mm -hmm. for these type of you know radical movements but i don't think they are really realistic in terms of having a realistic assessment of the capabilities I see. of the current regime as well right so you know if you if you lead people to believe that yes you know this is the time to storm you know the garrisons the storm the you know uh, central tv and radio stations etc and then you know you end up with a um, you know muscular regime that is able to then, you know, suppress and prevent those type of events, you know, then what you are really promoting, unfortunately, uh, is, is, is a sense of disillusionment, mm -hmm. right, and, mm -hmm. and a letdown of, of the citizenry. And I want us to try to avoid those type of, you know, scenarios that we should really learn from the experience of the, the past. After all, this is a regime where many of its, you know, if it's, uh, you know, uh, rank and file have either the experience of fighting in the Iran-Iraq war or have done tours of duty in places like Iraq or, or Syria. And so, uh, you know, these folks have no hesitancy about, you know, killing, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the protesters. So I think it becomes important for us to think about what we can do. In, in my view, you know, I, I admire the young people who are in the streets, mm -hmm. but also as a, as a political scientist, I know that a, a street protest die down after a while, right? If you want to paralyze the regime and force it to make concessions, mass protests need to follow these type of street protests that we are seeing right now. Yeah. We need to see massive civil disobedience uh, you know, you need to see the bazaar merchants closing Strikes. their yeah. doors of their shops. Absolutely. University students, oil workers and others coming to the scene. Okay. You said that you said that one of the things you would need to see is defections from the military, right. et cetera. Um, what else do you need to see? So you, you I, I hear you that on the the economic crippling of the country, and I mean, not that it isn't uh, economically crippled in some way already, but but I guess even even in our own history, if we look at 1978, 79, it was the strikes that that really enabled a lot of what became a revolution, right? Sure, absolutely, yes. And you know, during the Shah's time, certainly, uh, you know, the strike by the oil workers is really what broke the you know uh, broke the uh, camel's back, right? So that that was central in terms of depriving the state of a you know uh, important source of uh, resources, etc. Uh, you know. Uh, look, John, I think we have to keep certain things in, in mind mm. because of this changing uh, uh, scene that we have seen after the revolution. When, when we look now in, in, in terms of the composition of the labor force, we see, unfortunately, because a lot of factories have been closed down, right? We have a sort of a, a labor force that is predominantly in um, a small workshops of 10, 20, you know, uh, uh, 15 type of people, rather than these massive, uh, you know, um, uh, factories that, that used to operate under the shop. So we need to keep that in mind. We need to understand that, you know, at a time when people suffer rather seriously from economic, you know, uh, uh, problems, uh, a street protest is not going to be sustainable for too long. We are into week three of these things. Right. But my question is, will we be able to sustain this, you know, uh, three months, right. six well, months? But, I mean, they're certainly growing at the universities and high schools. Watching the videos today, it's 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 really amazing stuff to to see happening. What what do you Absolutely. think is what do you think is holding back that kind of mass action as you talk about it is it is it fear or i mean one would like to think that there's certainly a will on the part of the majority of iranians to to get rid of this regime what is the what is holding that kind of action back at this stage right there certainly is 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 the will 
but but again um if if i could put on my hat as sort of a you know sort of an objective analyst uh, look another prerequisite uh, for for a revolution in a in a country like Iran of 84 million or so, is that you know you need to really have millions of people come into the streets, right? A current protest in tens of thousands, right, is a still not yeah. tipping the scale, as as needed. Look, here is the danger that I see: um, if the regime resorts to uh, using brute force, right, which has been its uh, you know uh, trademark. Uh, yeah. Absolute yeah. trademark and you know playbook, right? Unfortunately, as you know that that repression will certainly lead to a reduction in the size of the crowds, right? We want the middle class in Iran to have a presence in the streets in these in these demonstrations. So whereas the regime is you know uh, very much likely to resort to this to this violence i think you know we should be mindful of how we can expand this strategy of civil disobedience rather than you know resorting mm. to uh, you know mutual uh, uh, violence right so for example w when i see iranians outside the country trying to attack iranian embassies that's not a, a, an action that i approve of look the iranian regime gave a black you know, eye to the whole country by its hostage taking and you know, res uh, right. uh, taking over of embassies. This is not what we are supposed to be doing in a in a lawful, you know, setting. Right? There, there are other ways of, pres you know, uh, manifesting your anger and in frustration and opposition but to the, the but uh, and i know that you can't do this in a sort of a day trading way but i but the the, the attack last night on on the students at sharif university uh certainly hasn't led to people not taking action in iran <laughs> if if by t today's actions are any any indication it's further uh, you know uh, given incentive for people to get out there so but i i hear what you're saying yeah. in terms of the you know if if you're if you, if there's a really severe crackdown on a mass level which we're kind of seeing indications that there is that that it can lead to um dispersing things why then did you put on instagram because i i, I saw this and thought oh you know dr burgetti thinks this is a real inflection point you wrote um the regime of ignorance and oppression is over did you mean that sort of on a, a, a macro level or, you know, within the next few years? Or do you do you think it's over? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it is really a, a, a regime of ignorance and of oppression. As I, as I mentioned before, you know, th this is a crisis ridden regime, right? They, they are not capable of solving problems. So even let's imagine that they managed to suppress, you know, this movement, mm. right? Uh, six months from now, another wave of protests will erupt. Right. Right. Why? Because the fundamental problems of the country are not being addressed. And this is not a regime that is capable of addressing those issues. Right. They are not they are not in the you know concession uh, mood, if you wish. And perhaps perhaps, you know, the health of the uh, uh, supreme leader, their worries about the transition, etc., is fueling this sense of we are not going to give concessions at this moment because if we do, the opposition is going to become even more aggressive, mm -hmm. right? But so they are resorting to what they did like last night at, you know, Sharif University, which only makes the people, you know, angrier and also leads to further, you know, defection from 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 the regime right, right. right so i think this is this is the fundamental problem that the islamic republic is facing you know right now you do not have the winning arguments to win over the hearts and minds therefore you resort to violence right and violence is subject to the law of diminishing return right there comes a point where the citizenry is no longer afraid right, right? Of, right. Of, of of that type of a you know, repression and the radicalization. Which, to a certain extent, we're there. I mean, we interviewed people on the ground, demonstrators uh, last week, and these brave young women and, and, and men were saying, I'm willing to die. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at that point. I take off my hijab and I go in front of them and whatever will happen will happen. I want freedom. Right. And, and, and again, I think right, rightfully so. What, what we have seen, right, over the course of particularly the last decade is that, you know, we saw that uh, this solution of, of presented by the reformists within the regime, right? 
gradual incremental change has not worked right look look what happened over the last two years right we had the lowest percentage of participation in the majlis election right in 2020 yeah. and then you know in the presidential election last year in 2021 where everything again was handpicked so that mr raisi could could you know emerge victorious yeah. or imagine right now right the leading two candidates who are being mentioned as successors to Mr. Khamenei are either his son or Mr. Reis. Neither right. one of these folks has any type of political capital, right? right? With right. the citizenry. So imagine even, you know, if they survive this round, which which they very much might might still do, right? Because I think when we look at revolutions, remember, it's not just the wishes of the opposition, but also the capabilities mm -hmm. of the ruling class, right? And I think that's where, you know, we need to, you know, uh, keep this in mind. But as I said, let, let's imagine that they even survived this one, okay? The frequency of protests is picking up, right? In, in Iran, yes. every time it's a different, you know, topic. And sometimes it's escalating, you know, increasing the price of petroleum that led to the protests of, you know, a few years ago. This time around, right? Again, one of the nice features of this round of protests is that this is not protests that are economic in, in nature, right? People are asking for political demands, right? right? There is nothing economical in terms right. of what, what they are, what they are addressing. So political demands resonates with a lot of people, but in particular the middle class, right? The middle class, which, you know, as we all know, democracy is built on the shoulders of the middle class. Right. So. So an Iranian middle class that has been suffering, their standards of living has been diminishing, right, by the day over the last four decades. We need to keep these folks engaged. We need to have them, you know, have that say, be present, right. you know, allow their kids to attend, you know, these protests, etc., rather than wanting to keep them in the house, you know, due yeah. to fear about what the regime might be doing. And you make, you make such a... A, a great point. I mean, we were talking earlier about the the these incredible scenes of high school students, uh, high school, young high school girls, chasing out you know their their principals, their their their, their you know people running the school, etc., right. um, showing defiance and uh, and you know your point is a it's a simple one, but it's profound, which is that these these aging male mullahs running the country have li literally have nothing to offer that would be attractive to a, a a high school kid in in Iran who is tapped into what's happening around the world right is tapped into the internet and and seeing the way kids live people are uh, conducting their lives everywhere else um so so that's that's very very powerful look i i um let me get to the theme of, of today's episode before I let you go, because that's the, one of the reasons we brought you on. I mean, when I have you here, I want to ask you so much. Sure. Um, uh, but th in this case, I know you're currently in California and you actually attended the the big demonstration in Los Angeles on the weekend. Yeah. And I know about that demonstration because I'm following people and friends in social media who are posting about it. Um, but frankly, if I wasn't, I probably wouldn't know that there were 25,000 people on the streets in Los Angeles uh, at the weekend, uh, as you would not know that there was over 50,000 here in, in Toronto. Um, it's, it's verging on, first it was a frustration, now it's just bizarre and outrageous to see the silence of, of the mainstream media in the West when it comes to the actions that the diaspora is taking and when it comes to covering something like last night, you know, I mean, uh, as a few people have pointed out, if this was a, a, a top-ranked university like the one you work in, in 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 North America and, you know, the state came in and started shooting students, um, you know, you're damn right this would be leading the news for the next few nights, right? Uh, and we see nothing about it. Um, and right. further, we're not really seeing that much on the agenda of, of our governments uh, or our institutions or our big companies in the West. What what do you attribute all of this to? Yeah, it is really unfortunate. Uh, you know, as I said, I think this this uh, we have never seen this type of uh, demonstrations and solidarity that was, 
exhibited, you know, uh, a, a couple of days ago uh, here. Uh, but yes, the, this, the silence is deafening. And, you know, I will frankly attribute it to the following. Um, you know, Western governments, at the end of the day, right, um, let's, let's, you know, speak uh, in a brutally honest fashion, they care more about the nuclear issue and about regional stability than human rights, in my view. Okay, uh, for them, um, you know, uh, governments in North America or in, in Europe, I think the, the prospect of regime change and the potential instability and ripple effects that it can have in the Middle East, right, um, is, is, is too much. Uh, Iran, after all, is, is a big country, right? And therefore, it is possible to, you know, think about how this problem can spill over to other countries and have that you know ripple effect yeah. and uh, and so countries are worried and and secondly uh from from the perspective of let's say you know the biden administration or the european you know governments i think their first and foremost priority is to prevent uh iran from becoming a nuclear state period right and therefore even though the current protests have made the likelihood of jcpoa you know less likely yeah I, I wouldn't completely rule it out because, again, assume if the Iranian regime is able to, you know, put a lid on these protests, then, you know, three months from now, six months from now, we might be back in Vienna once again having those, you know, conversations about JCPOA because that's what, you know, motivates for, for the Biden administration, for the Germans, for the British, etc. For them is not allowing Iran to become a nuclear state on their watch. But right. then, but then, uh, but then, but then, and I'm going to say something that sounds that's going to sound tragically naive, but I say it with that knowledge. Then we can only conclude that for all that Western governments, like the one in the, the government in the country that you're in, in the United States, talk about caring about human rights, at the end of the day, they they really don't give a shit. I'm afraid that's the case. You see. When when you are comparing the you know human rights against the 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 weighty issue of you know Iran becoming a nuclear you know state right certainly the latter wins right in terms of their priorities um, we have, and we have seen this problem again and again and look at the end of the day right uh, even though foreign support can be a factor and I don't you know deny that mm. at the end of the day. You know, I think it's the realities of what happens on the ground, you know, in Iran that is going to shape, right, the, the future of the country. At, at best, you know, these outside players, be they governments or corporations, etc., might be, you know, uh, giving a, a lending a hand, right, a supporting role, echoing those demands, mm -hmm. etc. But remember, you know, that they, these are not going to be the decisive factor. As somebody who does not subscribe to the conspiracy theories, right? I don't think the future of Iran is going to be decided in Washington or London. No, and, no, and nor do we want it to be. I mean, I'm, I'm right. a, you know, I'm a student of, you know, my degree was political science and history. And the first thing, you know, I mean, you you, you, you learn about history and you go, we don't want that kind of Western intervention. Absolutely. That's, that's what we fought Absolutely. against. But right. uh, I look at, look, this is the same calendar year as as the situation in Ukraine. And surely, if the world mobilized to support the Iranian people the way the world mobilized to support the Ukrainian people, rightly so, I'm not saying they shouldn't have, surely that would make a difference, wouldn't it? Well, you know, absolutely. But, you know, the two issues are a bit different from the perspective of the politicians sitting in Washington, London, and, 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 and you know, Paris, and others, right? Uh, you know, think about the the um, rivalry with with Russia and uh, all those you know uh, leftover sentiments of the of the Cold War, and you know not wanting the Russians to sort of uh, expand in mm. in in their quote unquote backyard as as the and the underlying factor that has led to this massive right transfer of uh, arms as well as um, uh, you know uh, money right mm. to support mm. you know uh, a Ukraine. I mean, you know, frankly, on, on account of the military advice, the financial support, right, that is being provided, I don't think in Ukraine we are just looking at a struggle between, 
you know, the Russians and the Ukrainians. No, I mean, U.S. and Europeans are really partners in this conflict because of the amount of, of, of the intensive participation that mm, they have, mm. right, in, in this thing sort of behind behind the doors. At, in Iran, we don't see that, right? And and um, uh, I, I don't think, you know, this thing really rises to the level of significance as mentioned. Besides, Gian, um, keep, keep this... Uh, factor in mind. Mm-hmm. I was ma- mentioning the point about um, uh, worries about you know ripple effects and instability in the region. Look, you are you are looking at a White House, uh, and I don't mean just the Biden administration. Same thing for Trump and you know others before him. Uh, the the notion of the the bad experience of the United States in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, right? Have made these sure. folks very much reluctant mm. about about getting involved long term, mm. right? In, in in this type of you know uh, conflicts uh, in 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 that re- part of the world. So I think they are hoping that this thing can can work itself out, right? Either mm-hmm. you know with the regime succeeding or the opposition managing to win you know quickly without much you know um, engagement. Uh, by by these Western countries is what they are looking for. Okay, now, so my go ahead. I, go ahead. So finish so your, finish my, your my point. Argument you. Is that we should we should be we should be thinking really about um, uh, how we can learn from the experience of the past inside our own country, right? What we learned in nineteen you know um, ninety nine in two thousand nine two thousand nineteen you know etc. about those you know, protests, what can be learned from, from you know, experience of other countries? One of the things, frankly, that I wish our opposition groups, you know, could have done was, you know, before this thing happened, uh, in, in anticipation of this thing, was to really create a sort of a think tank, right? Mm. About how you fight a regime like this. Look, in any revolution, you need to have a propaganda war. Right? Uh, wh- what? Wh- where were those intellectual elites of us, political activists, that really had you know studied the the ABCs right mm-hmm. of psychological warfare, of of you know uh, trying to see at a moment like this how do you go in terms of you know approaching foreign governments, foreign corporations, media as you pointed out, right? I don't think we we did our homework. In other words, this time around, and I'm saying this still while we are in the midst of these things, I hope for the best, right? Mm-hmm. But if it's it's not successful, I hope that for the next round, right? Those of us who care about what happens to Iran and its future, really we would use this as a wake up call to think more strategically. Look, it's fantastic to have those kids in the streets, right? But, the, you know, these type of movements that are without leadership, etc. Show me any example in the world where leaderless revolutions have succeeded, right? We need to have those type of, or, you know, uh, 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 sort of thinking core, right, of, of individuals who plan things, right, who tell the citizenry, the, the, you know, these are the tactics of civil disobedience. Right. This is what right. you need to do right. Right. with, with the, the Basiji in your neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, some some of that is happening, and there are mm-hmm. revolutions or, or major changes that happen where a leader emerges, you know, where Nelson Mandela comes out of jail, you know, or something, right? But but I, True. I, I, I do hear what you're saying. Um, but connect the dots uh, for me, if you will, that... You know, because I was asking a question, but not just but about the governments which you you answered, um, and also about the media. So, how does the, the 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 quiescence of the Biden administration, or the you know, or soft support, you might even say, if in some way, to for the for the regime, how does that connect to the the L.A. Times? not putting the protests that happened on the front page uh, or not making a story of what happened in Sharif University yesterday. Yeah, that that's really quite puzzling. I mean, like, you know, Washington Post, they had an article about, you know, the Iran protests, etc. But it really does not rise to, to the you know level 
that one expects considering you know the the crackdown and uh what's happening outside outside the country look i think we we should we should um uh take this again and make this into a learning moment right hmm. and see how we should be expanding our ties right you know meeting with the editorial boards of these type of you know la times washington post new york times etc to convey these messages to force their hands right whether, whether it's you know whether it's appealing shaming whatever you know people can decide what what the best approach is but but this is going to be you know a, a long term i think a struggle keep in mind keep in mind that um uh, we are talking about the country that does not have a good reputation in the eyes of most americans for example right. or, or, or you know canadians you know in, in the united states when they do you know popular surveys and ask people Guess two, what two countries are at the bottom of the barrel yeah. in terms of a positive look, right? North Korea and Iran, right? It's it's always the same, you know, two sort of uh, 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 co- uh, corporates there. So so l- let's think about this. That's why I think, you know, we need, you know, revolutions. Major changes really do require social engineering. They do require people uh, spending a lifetime, right? making these type of you know connections making these you know introductions etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. i am thrilled by by the fact that you know this r- current uh, round of protests has forced a lot of you know celebrities you know athletes etc to end their fence sitting and, and adopt a position that's great because you know what happens there is that it, it encourages that defections, right? From 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 the from the regime. People see their icons, right? Sympathizing with the, with the, with the population. But again, look, we we need to be expanding the tent. So shaming those who have not yet joined the tent, in my view, is not the proper way to go. We need to you know adopt that approach of you know let bygones be bygones, right? If you have come late. To the party we are still are going to be admitting you we want you there because think of the cumulative impact of these type of you're, you're you know, talking defection. about in iran right in iran, because absolutely. outside of iran at this point if someone hasn't picked their side they seem really late for the bus right it seems like because i think you know the handwriting uh, is on the wall right it's it's crystal clear what right. we are dealing with this is not you know, an isolated episode, right? We are seeing, as I said, waves and waves of protest. And, and you know, uh, uh, Iran, I think, you know, as, as a student of social sciences, uh, one thing that I have learned is that in predicting the future of Iran, one really needs to adopt a humble hmm. outlook. Iran is very hard to predict, right? Um, we didn't expect the 1979 revolution. We did not expect the Iran-Iraq war, the hostage crisis, Khatami's victory in 1997, and all those things, right? And, and, and the you know current waves of protests that are rocking the country right now. So those things, I would say, should humble any analyst in terms of you know predicting what the future of Iran is. Deterministic approaches are are, are something that we need we need to avoid. I I like to have that you know uh, optimism of will combined with the pessimism of intellect mm. right to think about what can go wrong what yeah. may go wrong and it, what you know lessons do we learn for the next it, round it's so it's something i've been saying and i almost feel uh you know i have some trepidation about vocalizing it because i don't want uh, people to be upset at me for raining on the parade or something but i do at times feel like there's a delta between the enthusiasm that we're feeling in the diaspora for this moment um in thousands the revolution has come and the reality of what seems to be happening in iran which is incredibly inspiring on one level but at the same time doesn't quite feel like it's that inflection point that that's exactly my uh, uh predicament as well right um, you know, I do not want to send a discouraging note, but at the same time, I am also simultaneously worried. Are we going to be letting people down yeah. by 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 you know promoting this sense of, as I said, false radicalism, only only to see it being crushed one, once again? I think we have to be, you know, realistic. Let's assess 
what the capabilities of the regime are, right? How can we bring about more, you know, defection from within its ranks? How can we paralyze it, right? Through those civil disobedience, mass strikes, etc. What are the pain points for this regime that, that are important for us to, to touch upon, right? I mean, look, as we said at the beginning, I think uh, the fact that you know the the rights of women have become has have occupied such a central position in this round of protests i am really hoping that this will be part of the culture mm. change that is going to happen in a male dominated right culture that men from now on will become much more sensitive mm. to the demands of women you know treat them with more respect in you know and not you know dismiss right their their uh, grievances about you know uh, dress code and, and the like like we have been doing you know uh, for, for the last four decades mm -hmm. um but but you know are we there are we there has has the country really wrestled intellectually with these issues i i, I mentioned one fact to you Gianna, based on my own research on on the uh, studying elections in iran right in 57 percent of iranian provinces Unfortunately, over the last four decades, not a single female has been elected to the Iranian parliament. 57% of yeah. the province. What does that tell you, right? Um, you know, women constitute 3% of members of parliament and 6% of candidates on average over the last 40 years. But they are 50% of the population, right? So, so these are certain facts that I'm hoping will will force not just the regime but you and i ordinary citizens as well to wrestle intellectually with this issue of women's oppression right can, can, can i can i ask you a final question that is sure. uh, again might seem like a naive one but you, you seem like the kind of person i should ask this of uh you know in in big the, these days in this current world the, the, the greatest gatekeepers, the greatest the powerful entities in our world are a few huge international corporations, right? I mean, um, and we see that when they t they can tip the scales in social movements. So, you know, whether it's the environment or LGBT movement, it's when, when Amazon or Google or Apple gets involved, um, it, it can make a really big difference. Is, is there any, uh, um, is there any role for 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 major corporations that that uh, in in this situation that that can enable and can and support those on the ground in Iran, uh, absolutely, and I hope more and more of them do so. Right? I mean, if you are a telecom company, let's say, how can you be helping this this cause in in in, in Iran? Right? By by you know facilitating. To allowing the, the population other alternative to bypass, you know, the, the crackdown that you're seeing on the internet, you know, in, 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 in the country. Look, in many of these companies, right, we have, you know, thousands of Iranian employees, right? Those should be, a, you know, a, 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 a lobby group, right? They should be pressuring those companies to be paying more attention to these things, whether, whether it's Google, Amazon, or, you know, what have you. In, in, in this regard. But, you know, let's also keep in mind something here. Um, this time around, right, I think we are also benefiting from the fact that the Iranian regime no longer has a monopoly over the media messaging, right? Thanks to these expatriate, you know, TV, radio mm -hmm. stations, etc. This message is getting back, you know, to the country. Right? Yes. And I think in many ways, it's giving them a moral boost. It's encouraging them. You know, yes. It's keeping them informed yes. about what's happening in the four corners of the country. Yes. So that's great, right? We have neutralized one of the traditional advantages of the regime in terms of having a monopoly over you know, the media. Sorry, and keeping them informed with what's happening in the, outside the world, too. I mean, that, 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 that's why these, I mean, as I was asking those those young people last week who we found in Iran, um, who are on the front lines there, they are aware that in London and in Los Angeles and in Toronto and Sydney that people are out on the streets supporting them. It means something to them. You, you bet it does. Absolutely. And, you know, besides, 
this this as we said this is this wire this technologically savvy generation that is able to follow what's happening in the rest of the world right even next door to them in dubai and istanbul let alone you know sydney toronto you know la right they are saying why can't i live like these other people right. next door to me right so so the ease of travel the ease of communication thanks to these you know technological innovations etc I think has really changed, right? The the ground upon which we are standing, and I think that's really part of the dilemma, part of the confusion of the Islamic Republic. How do you you know suppress these type of things? Okay, okay, you you, you close the internet, but then you know you need internet for your own you know fin- uh, financial and other types of you know, transactions. So you need to open it up, and people are able to you know come and go. Iran is not North Korea. People come and go, you know, mm. uh, into and out of the country. Messages, you know, get you know transferred, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So I think this is part of the dilemma, and we need to get more mileage out of this advantage that we have currently vis-à-vis th- this regime. And again, this is my plea, right, to those activists you know out there listening to us, that you know, let us plan ahead. For next round, let us, you know, ex- understand, study the experience of other countries, right? To see how we can come up with, a, you know, a, a blueprint for day-to-day action of challenging, you know, regimes like this. There are too many successful examples out there: Poland, you know, Romania, e- East Germany, right? Uh, South Africa, Latin America, Chile, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera that we need to learn from and supplement it with our own experiences from dealing with the Islamic Republic over the last, you know, 43 years so that, you know, we we are better prepared next time around. I, you know, frankly, as I said, even if the worst were to happen, um, I I think we have really reached that tipping point where this regime has lost its base, right? It has lost the support of the public. You know, going attending these uh, demonstrations outside the country was such a moral boost for me. Okay, because you will see people from yeah. all walks yeah. of life yeah. coming out and yeah, in unison, right, saying the same thing: "Enough is enough. We have had enough of you. We gave you a chance. You let us down. You are incapable of understanding." The, the problems of the country were offering a solution. Look, you know, what Khamenei said just today. Same old cliches. This is a conspiracy by United States and Israel, yeah. etc. So the people are misinformed. You know, our, our uh, 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 military and police force are doing, you know, the right thing, etc., etc. I mean, who is he kidding? Who is going to be yeah. buying those arguments now, right? It's going to be more of the same from from these folks. And, you know, a, a, a citizenry that is becoming increasingly restless, in addition to being dissident. Dr. Bergerati, as ever, it's a pleasure. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Great talking to you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. to a special edition of Rook, The Uprising, Where is the Western World? For all of our content on the current uprising in Iran and the questions around it, including voices from inside Iran in our previous episodes, go to our website, rookmedia.com, rookmedia.com. Arash Sobhani is going to be joining me from New York City in a little bit. Uh, Armin Amiri in Los Angeles. And a little later on, Shiri Nasiri in the UK. But right now, let's go to London and the managing editor of Kahan London and Kahan Life, Nazanin Ansari. She was the London producer and chief correspondent for VOA Persia. 
and moderated a bi-weekly roundtable discussion on Manitoba television. She's no stranger to being active in the Iranian community around the world. And right now, Nazanin Ansari joins me from London. Hello. Hello, Gian, and it's so good to be here and seeing you. I know we're all so tired. It's been uh, some a few, uh, many days and sleepless nights. Yeah. Yeah, I, most people I know, uh, certainly Iranians, uh, are caught in this vortex of scrolling through their social media feeds to see what um, uh, at turns inspirational or, or inspirational or, or horrific uh, thing they're going to see next coming from uh, Iran. I'm guessing that's the case for you as well. Very much so, especially you know images and videos coming out yesterday last night from Sharif University, Arya Mehr University, specifically there was one where there's this young woman, you know, like filming, videoing outside her car. Oh, and she gets and I don't know, shot. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it was my heart rate. Yeah. And I could not stop crying. You know, I don't like horror movies and it was like a horror movie. But then, you know, I, I said, my God, thank God I'm sitting here in the comfort of my home. Yes, it's long hours, no sleep mm. but then these young men and women you know women courageous ones uh day and night on the streets of all over iran yeah. and the least i can do is just carry on you know and it's the least we can do is just keep on reporting keep on reporting it's an interesting weekend wasn't it because for many of us there was the the energy and the um uh, uh, I've used the word a couple of times, exhilaration of the uh, of going to these demonstrations. You know, in Toronto, it was historic here. There's nothing, uh, nothing the Iranian community has ever seen anything like this. I mean, well over fifty thousand people. We don't even know the exact numbers, but but um, uh, and seeing that around the world, half a million strong. You know, um, and at the same time, hearing news like uh, and seeing the videos coming out of Sharif University last night was. Um, uh, it's a, such a, a mixture of emotions. How um, you, you live this stuff day to day? I mean, as the editor at, at Kahan Life and Kahan London, I mean, how, how have you been feeling the last couple of weeks in general? As you said, it's you know, it's up and down. It's exhilarating. You know, I've been following the story as someone who lived through the revolution. Actually, for me, the revolution started even be before nineteen seventy nine. You know, when I was a student in Iran and you could feel it and you could hear it in our high school, everybody turning against uh, the regime at that time, our teachers. And it was nonstop. Then I come to the United States. I was there, for example, I was just a young student, uh, first year in college, when uh, the Shah of Iran visited Jimmy Carter in Washington, mm. D.C. And I was caught <laughs> in the demonstrations that day in D.C. And um, for those of you who weren't possibly alive, you know, born at that time, uh, Washington, D.C., there were over 1,500 injuries uh, in one day uh, because of, you know, the leftists attacking us and then the police. It was mayhem. Mm. And I hadn't seen that. And then following on to that, the hostage crisis and, it's been 43 years, but then suddenly you see 16th of September, you know, suddenly the, these uh, people get out onto the streets. And what we had thought about, what we, we were, you know, we had never thought about that in one day, you know, Iran would erupt and just they would stay on the streets. Mm. And, and they have done so for the past more than three weeks. And then Saturday, you have all these demonstrations in more than 200 countries around the world, mm -hmm. cities around the world. And then, then last night, uh, the harrowing videos, it was awful. It was awful. But they keep, they're, they're going on, they're strong, and mm -hmm. we have to keep our spirits and we have to keep on reporting. And, you know, the positive thing is also, You've got all these international supports coming in. I know uh, there has been criticism of uh, why uh, Fox News or CNN didn't cover all these demonstrations yep. on Saturday. Yep. 
But um, and Nazanin Noor has been brilliant. She was on Fox News. I saw her clips, uh, and there there was a reporting as well for uh, BBC. Print media ha- have done their jobs very well. Um, print, um, really, what, what, what Western mainstream print media you think has done a, very, a good job? Well, the ones that are, you know, uh, the Guardian has done it. You know, most of the, you, when you go put in Massa and demonstrations, mm-hmm. the print media comes out. Uh, I've done but, exactly that. I've done exactly yeah, that. I can't yeah, I imagine was, if uh, so you're, you're, you're preempting me because I I was going to come to this. But if you want to go to go to it right now, I mean, I can't imagine if what just happened at Sharif University happened, you know, in in London. You know, yeah. uh, or or anywhere else in the world, I can't imagine that there'd be one article here and there. And yeah, if you put them all together over the last fortnight, you, there's there's a, a scattered number of them. But I mean, it's to me, it's absurd. Uh, I can't I can't believe. I mean, we just uh, you know we had a historic demonstration here in Toronto, not just for the Iranian community, for Toronto, fifty thousand people or more. That's that's an event, and and yes. and the media basically ignored it. I mean, how. That to me I is. I didn't follow the Canadian media, uh-huh. but, but it, okay, the, 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 the U.S. Media, media, the no, U.S. media. But, where is you it? Know, I'm talking about not about the demonstrations on Saturday, okay. but the entire situation in Iran. I'm following up. You know, when you look compare it to 2017 or 2019, sure, sure, we haven't seen that kind of cover. We didn't see that kind of coverage. 2017, 2019, we've had. Daily protests from 2019 onwards, from the teachers, the pensioners, and we've covered it in Kehan Life, but you don't see it. You haven't seen it elsewhere. No, no. So perhaps for me, as someone who has been covering this, and we have followed all these protests on a daily basis, um, I mean, you know, the the motto comes, beggars can't be choosy. Maybe I'm yeah, seeing yeah. the glass yeah, well, half full rather than half empty but yes i was hoping i was hoping cnn would do more i was hoping bbc has done a lot um i mean four but articles there's is, still more to be done four or Definitely. five four or five articles in the new york times over the last uh, two weeks at, at the most i mean it's it's not but new york times as well i mean their uh, their piece today has aroused a lot of criticism yeah it's, it was horrible uh, i yeah. mean it's ho- again but let me tell you something. My reaction is, did I expect more from that Iranian, so-called Iranian-American journalist? No, I didn't expect more from her. And, uh, and it's a shame. It's a true shame. Mm. You know, that's all I can say for any Iranian, whether Iranian, Iranian-American, who's professed to be so in love with Iran, so in love with the landscape of iran mm. so in love with the archaeology so in love with their far the foreign mm-hmm. minister mm-hmm. mr zarif and you know attending all you know briefings whether covered or not and then when something like this happens shame on them i'm sorry well, shame you know that th- this is the thing right it's it the thing is is that uh i'm not sure what the i mean i think you're absolutely right and i can i can Definitely, for someone who's been in the trenches the way you have, um, suddenly seeing some coverage, any coverage is is an improvement, and that's how um, the young people in Iran have moved the goalposts, not just within Iran, but but outside of it. But I, I still think it is um, it is outrageous to me that we are we are if if the comparables right if something like this is i mean we just look i i hate to keep doing this comparison because i know that there's nuances to it that make it very different but but we've just witnessed the the U- ukraine we've just witnessed how the world can come together when it sees injustice happening uh i mean the premier league the football league in in england that i follow changed the flag to the ukrainian flag on the <laughs> on the soccer pitch you know and and you know so is it would it be that much of a stretch for us to think that when it comes to an issue this isn't some difficult internal you know weird economic issue in iran or something this is like basic human rights it's very strange to me or i dare say conspicuous that we're not seeing more 
um, more coverage of this. The only thing I can conclude, and you're in media, you know this, is that they some of these outlets think their stakeholders, i.e. their audience, um, doesn't care or isn't interested. They don't feel there's enough of a direct link. It's somewhere off in the Middle East. These things happen. Um, and or they take their cues from governments uh, that don't seem to be putting this as a as a priority. And, and, and I guess I would get straight to the question and say, if we ask where is the world in terms of, you know, where where is everyone from the Biden administration to to the governments around the world uh, um, and, and throw in the media with them, what would be your answer in terms of why this doesn't seem to be more of a pressing priority when there's kids being shot at in a, in a university compound? Well, the way I look at it is what job we need to do, how much more we need to do. And I think that is what's keeping us going, is that not to be, yes, it is, it is correct, it is right to be angry, frustrated, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't carry on, that it means that we should increase our efforts and put more effort behind it. And thank you so much, Jian, for having me on your program today and bringing up these issues. And I know Canada and the uh, Iranian Canadians have been at the forefront of this. Hamid Ismail yeah. I mean, he's an amazing man. Yeah. Uh, his name will go down in the history. Uh, he's a leader. He's already. a leader. He, yeah. Yeah. He's one of the leaders, definitely. Yeah. And also, what we are seeing are emerging leaders and emerging figures of the future. And I think one thing that we also need to do is give hope and optimism uh, to those on the streets in Iran that we are behind you. I mean, the biggest, my, my biggest, um, you know, source of uh, encouragement, daily encouragement are tweets from Anonymous hmm. saying, hello, Iran, we are behind you. Every day they are coming and saying, don't lose hope and there are more and more uh, anonymous, you know, atlas joining in. Google, for example, uh, has uh, today uh, established uh, VPNs, uh, free access to Iranians inside. Skype has done it. I, I wish Twitter would make a stand as well. The least they could do is have a, um, uh, you know, a special... Uh, you know, not hashtag, but hash image, uh, you know, for Massa. Mm. Um, I, I wish they would kick out uh, this, uh, you know, man, Mr. Khamenei, you know, ab after three weeks right. of total silence, people were just saying he's dead. Here he comes out, he makes all this speech, blaming foreigners, but then not having the guts you know, not having the guts, he says, I am so sorry, but he doesn't have the guts to say Mahsa's name. Mm. That's the name of the, you know, I mean, what kind of a man is he? What kind of a human being? But, you know, after all, we know what kind mm. he is. So there's a lot of work to be done. And if we can do it and let's get courage from the students and from the youth and from all those mothers and fathers that are in Iran, look, we are getting daily messages from inside the military, uh, the police force. Um, there are reports now that, uh, you know, many of the Basijis uh, do not want to take part. There's over 500,000 Basijis, mm -hmm. and they haven't been able to mobilize more than one fifth of them, mm -hmm. specifically because you know, their families don't, are a part of the protest. It's funny you should say that. Dr. Borgia was just saying what we need next is to, if, if it really is a revolution, is to see, for example, defections from uh, the military and police. And we haven't really seen that on a mass scale yet. But, but um, yeah. uh, if we're starting to see those indications, it makes a big difference. You know, one, one of the things that um, I feel like I, I've been thinking about this, I haven't said it yet, but that, you know, the, the those brave young women and and men in iran who are on the front lines who are doing the demonstrating um and who are pushing that envelope moving those goalposts as we say you know 
Uh, they're not just doing a, a service, I feel, to those inside Iran um, in, in the cause of a, a, a regime change, whether it's tomorrow or two months from now or two years from now. But I feel like they've done a service for those Iranians, uh, those of us of Iranian descent around the world, because they have, you know, I've talked to you about this before. One of the one of the precipitants for starting Rook Media, and and I'm sure one of your precipitants for starting Kahan Life is was to um, was on a hunch that those of us around the world in the Iranian diaspora feel a connection with each other and have common interests and have common cause, and that's really crystallized in the last two weeks. You know, it was a very proud moment on the weekend to see. The world, as you say, 200 different cities, I mean, half a million people uh, rising up. This this Iranian community uh, are pretty freaking united to, to, around um, wanting to do something together. And, and who do we owe thanks to for that? Um, you know, 18-year-olds, 20, 22-year-old uh, women in, in, in Iran. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing thing they've done. They have done an amazing thing, you know, the courage they have, you know, of going to see, you know, they're facing bullets, they're facing, you know, I mean, these people are scary. And they go there with all their courage. And the least we can do is just remain hopeful, keep a steady mind and move on. And good news is coming. Um, I have no doubt about it. I just wish my father was alive, mm. that he could see this day, because a lot of our older generation are passing away without yeah. hope of seeing Iran. But I wish he was alive and he would see that soon we'll be going back, without a doubt. Thank you for saying that. That my Yesterday was my father's, the eighth anniversary of his death, and, and um, I went with uh, my mom and, and my cousin, we were at the, the cemetery, and... Um, I was thinking exactly that, that um, my dad uh, hated what happened to Iran, hated this regime so much. And, um, you know, he would be taking inspiration, surely now, you know, at, 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 the, at, the, at, at young people trying to change this thing, you know. And, you know, we have to remain hopeful and energetic and just keep carrying on and get enough sleep as well, because we've got many days ahead of us, you know, we cannot just be like a candle burning all, you know, all through the night. Mm. Um, I keep saying this to myself to make sure that I stay healthy because there is a road a lot, you know, ahead of us that we have to carry, not just for ourselves. I don't want anything for myself. What I'm doing now is for the future generation. Iran means something, that land. What did Zoroaster always, he was the, and I'm not Zoroastrian, mind you, I'm not Zoroastrian. But when I think back, the hashtags that he created, good thoughts, good words, good deeds. There were so millenniums ahead of it, uh, you know, the time. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know that he was thinking of them as hashtags, but, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But, you know, and so the beauty of that country, that, you know, I just want to go back just to smell the air, to see the, you know, I know the air today is not as clean as it was when I was there before, but the lights, the sounds, the smells, and to be able to, for Iranians to have, to lead a normal life. We deserve better than what yeah. we, we've had in the past 43 years. There's still a long way to go, obviously, to get there, but... Um, but um, I, I, I love your... You have to visualize yourself I, there. I love your... I love, and you oh, know, I... I don't I, dare. I, I, I actually don't. I have, I have a different... I can't do it. I can't go there because I'm for fear of disappointment. Not not that I can't go to Iran. I, I can't now. But I can't go there in my mind of the idea that I could because I'm too scared that I'll be d profoundly disappointed if it doesn't happen, you know? But you're right. Maybe no, I should try no, and... No, don't. No, no. You have to be hopeful because we need to turn... Evin prison into a museum. Mm. This nightmare has to come to an end. Let me let me. Ask I, you, I become very emotional. I know. As I know. Speak. It's and I, I I understand. Um, as a final question, I mean, maybe to to um, 
leave off where we started, uh, at least for now. I, I look forward to talking to you on an ongoing basis uh, as ever. But, you know, you were talking in the beginning about you live in London and, uh, um, you know, that, you, that you're in tears and yet you think the, of the privilege that we have living in the West compared to actually being inside Iran and, and wanting to battle these things. Um, there's a there's a this is not an easy one. There's a conversation that's come up recently, in, especially in the last two weeks, about the responsibility we have in the West when it comes to people, um, young people, say in Iran or anybody in Iran, in terms of what we could should or shouldn't tell them to do. Um, and there's folks who feel very uncomfortable with the idea of those of us in the West saying get out on the streets, you know, because we're of course not facing the guns or the, the crackdown. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we want to, um, um, we're, we're energized by the protests and, and we want to support them somehow. Well, how, how do you navigate that? How, how have you navigated that uh, over the years, that sort of delicate line of not wanting to tell Iranians in Iran what to do? Well, I mean, the only thing I could do has been, you know, just to report what's happening, the stories that haven't been told, that were off the airwaves. So I've always, we've always, Kehan London has always covered the stories that were not told elsewhere. And uh, these were the voices, voices of people who were kept, you know, quiet or were silenced. So that has been uh, our audience. But right now, it's not us telling the people, to, uh, me telling the people, oh, go on the streets. Not at all. It is actually the, the leaders who are inside every Iranian group that you see outside has roots back inside. Mm. And every group inside has roots uh, outside. They are working together. They are communicating with one another. Of course, uh, we listen to them. What they are telling us is that they need more support. They need global support. They need the support of the international media. They need the support of Western personalities. And these days you can see how many uh, artists, I mean, these are, you know, it's not us telling, you know, no longer me saying, oh, I'm, you know, uh, go do this or this regime is bad or what's happening. No, the people inside are saying yeah, it. Yeah. And we're just reflecting and just reporting what's, what they are saying. And what they want, we will, you know, the stories that they want to be told, they come to us. It is not us that have gone, you know, looking for messages from the Artesh, for example, or the police. They are sending it to us because they want these stories to be told. And that's what we're here to do. Nazanin Ansari, it's always a pleasure. I thank you, and I'll see you soon. See you soon, Jian. And Bye. sleep, sleep yeah, well. You too. Take you care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. The breath of the morning I keep forgetting The smell of the warm summer air I live in a town Where you can't smell a thing You watch your feet in the All right. Next, let's go to New York City. And uh, my next guest, who's an Iranian American musician, TV host, and producer, Arash Sobhani, is perhaps best known to Iranians across the globe as the lead singer and guitarist of the Persian rock band Kiosk. But he's also known for his tireless activism and action against the current regime in Iran. Arash was the host of the popular satirical news program on VOA Persia on 10 and has more recently been the producer of Persia's Got Talent and the music TV series Replay. And right now, Arash Subhani joins me from New York City. Hello, sir. Hi, Jan Jan. It's, it's always good to talk to you. It's always good to see you. And especially in these, um, I don't know how to say this, these historic times, it's, 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 it's always good to uh, talk with friends and, and just, you know, pour yourself out. Same, same. Uh, and and historic times uh, is, a, is a good way to put it. I was going to say we're coming off a, a weekend that I feel was exhilarating in terms of seeing thousands of our sisters and brothers of Iranian descent on the streets in Toronto and New York, where you were and elsewhere around the world, and also devastating in terms of the brutal crackdown that continues in Iran and the students at uh, Sharif University yesterday in Tehran being the latest recipients of that crackdown. How, let me just ask you in general, first of all, Arash, how are you feeling? 
Well, you know, um, like everybody else, I think uh, we've never felt this close to victory. Uh, we see all the images coming from Iran, our hearts broken, our heart goes to all these uh, students, brave young Iranians who are like amazing. Uh, what they're doing right now is, 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 is just, uh, you know, uh, there's no words to, that can describe it. But at the same time, I'm really hopeful. I'm really hopeful that, that, that this will be the end of it and then we won't have to relieve uh, the, 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 the whole nightmare that we've been living in the last 43 years. So uh, I want to cling to that feeling. I want to stay hopeful and positive and just, you know, look at, look at all, the, uh, all the things that have changed in those uh, last few days. Yeah. Iran is never going to be the same. I mean, speaking of which, I mean, how do you, how do you, I wanted to just ask you just because I, it just blew me away watching those high school students, particularly high school girls chasing off a, a, a regime official today. I'm sure you've seen that video. What, what do you make of high school students getting involved in Iran right now? You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. This is a generation that the whole regime has invested, you know, so much, uh, they brainwashed them from, from uh, kindergarten, you know, they have the TV. They have the schools, they have all the media, they control everything from cinema all the way to, you know, what music can be published or books and stuff like that. And yet you see this generation that has not been exposed to, to what Iran was like before the 79 revolution. These are the kids who are kicking out officials from their schools. And it's such an, you know, it's such a empowering feeling to see them do this. And I think a lot of it has to do that uh, in the last few generations, we've all tried our own way of trying to change Iran, you know, uh, from 79 revolution all the way to now. For instance, my own revolution, my own generation, we, we thought, you know, the reformists were the way to go. And, and a lot of kids from my generation, they went uh, and voted for Khatami and they yep. put a lot of effort and, and uh, invested in, on, in Musavi and Khatami and the reformists. But, uh, you know, at the end, we, we were uh, faced with this great feeling of, uh, uh, disappointment and, and and failure, and and I think these kids they know something that we we should have known then, and they've they've known they've seen you know all the different uh, routes that different generations tried to to make a better Iran, to try to convince the regime to to open up and hear them out, uh, and I think th these generations are not making that mistake again. They're going for it. Um, just a, as a sidebar, I mean, you've been someone who famously. Um, hasn't been a reformist in recent years, at least. Uh, it, does it feel like some kind of I told you so moment for you? Uh, it does, and I think we should let it go. I think a lot of us, uh, a lot of us who got a lot of uh, criticism back then when we were against the reformists, we did things against the reformists, we wrote songs, we, uh, you know, published our, uh, our articles or, you know, whatever we did, we were told like, oh, you guys are just too radical, da da da. And now those people who were uh, pointing fingers at us then, are now realizing that this this regime is not reformable. So there is there is a feeling that you want to say I told you so, but at the same time you know everybody who did whatever they did was for to make Iran a better place. Nobody wanted to to betray Iran, and so you know I think we should just let go of the past. Anyone who's done whatever they've done, if they are on the side of people right now, I think that's what counts. This is the final battle, I think, and and I think we should invest in every single person who can help us from the you know celebrities the athletes whoever you know who's whoever wants to help we should welcome them so i, I was just speaking to dr borgerdi who was saying something very similar in terms of everyone that can should be let in right now to if they're willing to make the decision now finally let them in and and and, and we need them for sort of a a, a mass uh, um, uprising he he also though was saying you know in terms of you saying victory is near he he was saying we need to manage expectations he said that in his years of study in post-revolutionary iran there's there's and revolutions around the world there's there's certain tenets that have to take uh, have to be part of things have to take place and and that we're not seeing some of that for example he was saying you need to see defection from the military and and the police forces and we haven't seen that in big numbers yet um do you really think vi victory is near do you disagree with him yeah, I think I think uh, he's got a point. You know, we have to we have to really control our expectations because uh, every time we've had higher expectations, it's always like that. You know, when when you fail, it, it's a bigger failure than and if you if you're realistic and practical. But I think um, uh, yes, we haven't seen defections in large numbers yet, but it's only been almost two weeks, so we can't expect that. We haven't still taken control of the streets yet. 
these kids are not going back from from what, what we see on the on the, on the news and, and uh, on social media and even if they do it's not not going to be the same so we're going to have to we, we're going to see changes things are going to change and uh, the defection will come too it's too early to expect that i think and at the same time yes we have to manage our expectations but stay hopeful stay positive and from what we see today I mean, you you were in Toronto. You saw fifty thousand people. It's it's, it's unbelievable. It's you know unheard of. Yep. No other community has done this. Yep. Uh, outside of the country, so I think. And you this, were in New York. You you were at the demonstration in New York. I know, having lived there for a couple of years, there's there's you know there's a community there. It's ne- nowhere in the near the numbers of uh, Los Angeles and Toronto. Yet I was seeing the overhead shots of the New York demonstration, and it was also massive. Tell me about the vibe on on the on the weekend. Yeah, and, I, and you know it's interesting because New York and and San Francisco, not the Bay Area, San Francisco itself, it has a community of Iranians, but they don't. Uh, they're mostly artists or uh, professionals who don't hang out with each other. They don't have a like an Iranian hub or even a website that they all go to. You know, they all have their own interests and they kind of like melted and uh, integrated into the, into the into the host society here in San Francisco. The same, but. It was amazing. I didn't know so many Iranians lived in New York, and and all of them, you know, they all put aside their their political differences, and everybody was was screaming, uh, demanding change, uh, you know, uh, uh, chanting her name, Masa Amini, and it was just beautiful. It's just beautiful to be part of that. Okay, so let me, um, on that note, get to the the theme of today's program and what I also wanted to hear from you. Um, and the, the show is called "Where Is the Western World?" or, or, or more specifically, "Where the Hell Is the Western World?" Um, I can't remember a time I've lived here most of my life. Can't remember a time in Toronto when we had more than fifty thousand people demonstrating in the streets and it barely made, you know, a barely barely an article, barely a news report. Um, and that seems to be universal. Um, and beyond the media, uh, government leaders issuing tweets or soft sanctions here and there. I mean, w- w- what do you think is going on? Where is the world? I, I think this is this is a this is the heartbreaking uh, part of this whole uh, uh, events that are happening. Is that you see all these feminist groups, all these groups that uh, are so called progressive. Uh, all these leftist groups uh, that you know were against, um, uh, you know, or better better say uh, they were all uh, acting like the, or saying that they're pro uh, democracy, pro freedom, pro equality, pro women's right. Where are they? They they took pictures with Zarif every time he showed up in New York. They even went to Iran and took pictures with him there. Where are they now? Where are the politicians? Where are the female politician figures that you know claim to be the feminist government or the feminist uh, first feminist this and that and da da da? And they're they're just missing in action. You take that and then you see that there's there's a pressure from somewhere that's shutting down all the media. I mean, you've been in the media. You know how much left has influence. And and the the the, the thing that they don't realize is that this is for the benefit of the West. Also, if there's a change in Iran. It's good for everyone. It's not just about Iran. It's good for Afghanistan. It's good for Iraq. It's good definitely for the Western countries because if a stable Iran means a stable Middle East, means less refugees, less crisis for the Europeans and the Americans, I, it's, it's just mind boggling that they don't realize that and they're putting their eggs in the basket of the terrorists who fail them time and time again. They never ever uh, uh, respect the treaties they signed, the, you know, the the, uh, the document, whatever, you know, you can't, you can't just deal with these guys because they, they say one thing and they do another. And everybody knows that. It's just uh, the influence that these uh, uh, ignorant and uh, groups have on the, on the media and on the, on the administration here is just uh, tragic because it's not in the interest of the United States. So l- let me take that one at a time. First of all, let me ask you about the governments and, and the administrations, because they certainly there's certainly a lot of lip service towards human rights. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of empathy, sympathy and support um, when Ukrainians were being killed, as there should be uh, from around the world earlier this year and, and continues to be. Um, I mean, I, 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 I said this to Dr. Borgerdi moments ago, but but how, how are we supposed to think that there's any interest at all in human rights if 
um, if, if nothing has been done. In other words, is it your opinion as well that, uh, I don't know, nuclear deals or somehow enabling some idea of stability in the Middle East, which means keeping the current regime there, uh, that that trumps human rights for Western governments? I think that's that's the case, and I think they have bad advisors. I, I think uh, Islamic Republic is invested in a in a lobby here in the states and, and in Canada, and they've you know they've been at it for at least fifteen years. You know, m- creating these networks of of uh, journalists, politicians, uh, and and academics, and now they mobilize all of them. And what they don't realize is it's, it's funny. You know, it's, it's it's a side story, but funny today. Uh, I saw an image of an Iranian drone that was captured by the Ukrainians. Okay, so you spend you you, you send all this money to Ukraine uh, to fight the Russians, and then you want to lift sanctions on Iran so they can import all these parts and create drones that you're going to send money to destroy again. So it's just you know I don't get it. If you if you don't care about human rights and you only t- care about your national interests. Even for your national interest, it's it's better for you that the mullahs go. And 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 guess what? Iranian people are doing it for free. This is the deal. And 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 I think the biggest mistake this administration can make is not to see that the 2009, what Obama did back then, left a scar. It was the lowest point of the American uh, and Iranian people's relationship. Iran, you know, Islamic Republic is never going to be friends with America, but the Iranian people are natural allies in that region. You know that. And and to disappoint them, to let them down, is just a huge political mistake. Why even if you don't care about why anybody. is that if that if that's true, if that's the reason why the, the governments are not um, you know, say the US administration or whatever is is as I say, enabling things. Well how does that connect the dots with the media for me? Because I mean, you know, you're sitting in New York, there's some big papers there. The New York Times there's been some mention today. They had an article that it's it's about the economy. I don't even know what that uh, that the, the 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 uprising is about the economy, which was I don't know if that's just a somebody slapped on the wrong headline or if they're really out to lunch because it seemed like a very strange thing to to write in the middle of this. Uh, um, but um, where is the connection between? Uh, is there one between what you're talking about with the administration and and say the editorial board of a major newspaper? Why why isn't this more on the agenda? I think everything, unfortunately, in these times, at least what I feel in, in, the, in the States is that everything has become too uh, uh, polarized in, you know, in terms of uh, Republicans and Democrats. Everything is being looked at from one of these perspectives. Nobody uh, takes a, you know, uh, a, 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 a view from a higher up and look at the big picture. Everybody's just focused on the narrow uh, narrative that they have from the political party, which is the sad part because there's so many issues that needs the collaboration of both parties. But but and, sorry, sorry, are you saying that the, so standing up for human rights in Iran is a Republican thing to do? That's no, not. No, it's, it's actually it's it's a bipartisan thing. Well, of and course it is. That's why I mean, what how, how, how what's what does polarization have to do with you know focusing on um, people being killed? And I mean, as has been pointed out by a few people over the last twenty four hours, if that if what happened at Sharif University yesterday happened you know in a university in paris or toronto or exactly you know th- it, it, it would be headlines for weeks i mean it's insane well, let me ask you this let me ask you this you brought up the new york times uh, article new york times two weeks ago uh they said that Khamenei is about to die he's in his deathbed da, da, da. he showed up on tv they didn't take it back what did they do they said no we stand by our article yesterday he came he walked he was healthy as you and i and New York Times still decides to run the article by the same person who's been feeding them wrong information for over, I don't know how many years. Do you think editorial in New York Times doesn't know that? There's been demonstrations in New York Times. There's been billboards against this person in New York Times, uh, in front of New York Times. I'm pretty sure the editorial in New York Times knows what's happening in Iran. I'm sure they know that this person is not giving them right information. But why are they doing this? Why are they uh, spending their credibility, like many other outlets are doing that, uh, it's just beyond me, you know, or CNN for, for, or NPR. They never, ever invited one person from the opposition group when they have uh, discussions about Iran. This is just, uh, and, and the administrations, they've been around for a couple of years, this new administration, they never invited a, an opposition figure. They've always been talking to, you know, pro-Iran lobbyists. They have an 
you know influence in the in the in the negotiation team even but they never invited anybody from from the people's side and uh and the media just lets that go and i think this is this is a really sad moment for for anyone who who, who claims uh, that they uh, they are pro democracy pro human rights pro progressive parties or whatever so there's a um i mean there's a there's a an attitude that some people have um when i've said where is the world where is the media um that they kind of say you know this is on social media so they respond to me and go well, fuck them we don't need them we're doing this ourselves and and surely uh self-determination for people inside iran for iran we we all agree with that i mean i, I would like to think um but but I kind of feel like that's a bit of an easy answer. I, I, I want the, the, the attention of the world on Iran. I want people around the world to be realizing how horrible what's happening is. I don't think the silence of the world helps um, the cause of, for those of us who would like to see a change in Iran. Um, where, where, where do you stand on that idea that, that, well, you know, we can do this ourselves, forget them, you know? No, I think we, we need we need all the news outlets, we need all the media, uh, and not only just to inform people, but also make politicians take actions. You're demanding, I mean, Hamid Esmanilion said uh, in the rally in, in Toronto, you're demanding for the diplomats to be kicked back, kicked out of their con you know, uh, European countries or Western countries. If you stand by democracy, these guys do not represent the people of Iran. We need actions. We don't need just, just you know, uh, uh, being the voice. We are beyond that point. And, and the media has, has uh, failed us big time. Uh, I don't know if you saw Louis C.K. today. He was even uh, pissed at CNN that you know uh, you you uh, turn on CNN and you see everything, but a revolution that's happening in Iran. That's the most progressive event in the Middle East about women, centered around women, led by women, and you ignoring that. How can you do that? Do you see? Uh, do you do? You, did you hear about the sanctions from the European European Union being pro uh, proposed today? Um, and there were some, as I called them, soft sanctions. But there were some. Sa I mean, the Canadian government is sanctioning the IRGC. I I don't totally know what that means. I mean, it, I guess it means I don't know what <laughs> certain individuals can't. Or, 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 I, I I really don't know. You know that's that seems to be the, a step or two before actually finally coming around to to calling it a terrorist group. But um, but what what do you make of sanctions like that? I think I think they can do a lot more. Uh, look at Russia. Look at what they did to the Russians, the oligarch. You know those people who stole the money from the Russian people and they've been living in, in London and have what you know in Western Europe. We need something similar to that. We need to, to we need to freeze their assets because these assets belong to Iranians. We need to kick them out of the country because they do not believe in democracy. They don't, do not respect human rights. And uh, we need a lot more than this. It's a good sign that they're noticing, that they're realizing that the Iranian diaspora is not happy with, with, uh, with what, whatever the Western politicians are doing. But I think we, as Iranians uh, living outside of Iran, we should push for more. We should ask more definitely in the elections that are coming in the US. Iranians have a big voice. They've been big donors to these parties. And I think they should use, uh, use that uh, uh, leverage to to demand more because a safe, free Iran is better for for you know stable Iran is, is better for everyone. Period. A final question to you, Arish. Uh, Arish John, we, you're you're in touch with some people, I assume, inside Iran. What are you hearing from them? Uh, it, I, again, I, I what I hear is is, is from uh, from people that are like you and I, hopeful. They are very worried. They really know how critical these times are and how uh devastating it could be if, if we don't win this time but at the same time i've never seen this much hope coming out of that country and you know iran needed hope we talked about hope last time we we, we had a discussion mm -hmm. 43 years of killing that you know the notion of hope was just they, they changed the meaning even that word didn't mean anything uh, anymore uh you know they misuse it so much but now you feel that from inside the country that people are hopeful, people are finding each other, people are trusting each other. This was something that was missing. People didn't trust each other. But now, let, let me tell you this: when you when you go to 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 a, to a uh, uh, you know you're crossing the street and the and the and the red light uh, the the uh, pedestrian light is broken, you and two three four other people you know you're looking at the cars and there's a moment that you all decide that okay it's our turn we should go in and stop the traffic. 
that moment is is you don't you don't write a contract you don't create a coalition or anything you just look at each other and you feel it and that's the feeling that i uh, that i've been hearing from my friends inside iran that they started trusting each other now if somebody goes this direction people feel like you know just like the school of fish you know they all trust each other when they go after the instincts that's what we're seeing and i think that's beautiful all right take care of yourself we'll talk again soon thank you for having me see you This is a special edition of Rook of the Uprising. Where the hell is the Western world? I'm going to go to Los Angeles now. And Armin Amiri, an Iranian-American actor, producer, and interior designer. He was born in Tehran, left Iran at the age of 13, and after a couple of stops in Turkey, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia, he sought political asylum in Vienna, Austria. In 1989, he moved to San Francisco and studied at the ACT Conservatory. He has an extensive range and impressive resume in the film industry alongside his artistic works as well. Armin has had a successful career in interior design with celebrated works in various clubs and restaurants in New York City. Right now, Armin Amidi joins me from Los Angeles. Hello, sir. Hello to you. How are you? I'm well. You know, I think we're all we're all feeling similar things right now. It's it's good to see you again, sir, uh, brother. <laughs> but uh, these are these are weird days. I, I, I know you've been really active in social media in the last couple of weeks. Listen, before we get into specifics, um, t- tell me how, as someone who's been outside of Iran for many years, this is hitting you so hard emotionally. Sure. Um, thanks for having me. For first and most important to hopefully we could you know spread some more you know information about what's happening on the ground um it has affected me the way um look uh, mass amini uh, was uh, was born in sapes kurdistan which my mother was born and was from and i recently has lost my mother and the only way i was able to to watch her leave her body uh was through whatsapp and so uh, that is making me angry, just a personal note of what this government has done to its people that has separated them in heartbreaks and torture and killing. He has brought up this old wounds and um, trauma that I experienced being in Iran, leaving in Iran, and coming out and, and, and trying to find a better life. But at the time, uh, the only thing I could have done uh, to, to voice my opposition against this regime was to leave and say, hey, you know, I disagree with you, but at age 13, I'm ready to leave and keep my spirit up. Right. That does not satisfy me anymore. That kind of a voice of silence and just by your actions, you're going to like show people in the world. Obviously, we're not capable of doing that because we're all taking part in this revolution. And, and don't make any mistake, it's a revolution. And nobody wants to cover it. And I'm sure we're going to get to that. Yeah, we'll but get as to far that. as my field yeah. goes, the cycle has opened up. The wounds are open. And uh, I, I, I have nothing 
no other interest but seeing this freedom yeah. and uh, it, liberation. It's, it's, it's one of those things where, especially when you're speaking to non-Iranians, um, there's a convenient narrative of, uh, oh, this thing just happened, Masa Amini, suddenly there's a you know, a movement built around it. And, and yes, it's true that there, for example, there's brave women who are on the front lines of this, et cetera. But, but this is something that any Iranian knows has been bubbling for, for years, for decades, uh, as you've articulated. Uh, I want to get to your, your anger, but, but let me ask you this, because you're the first person we've had on, uh, well, I, today that's, uh, that took part in the Los Angeles demonstrations. Um, how, uh, you know, you saw what it was like here in Toronto. Tell me about the mood and and what you experienced in in Los Angeles over the weekend. Because even as much as L.A. is known as you know one of the epicenters of the Iranian diaspora, um, it, it must have felt like a, a next level to to be amongst those thousands of people. Um, just talking about it is getting me emotional because it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever witnessed in my own life. To watch my brothers and sisters all come together, 25,000 of them, to stand in solidarity with their brothers and sisters in Iran. And more than anything against, you know, this, this government. And so we were all there. Some of us were doing a lot more than the rest, but it didn't matter. People were getting involved. People were putting their yellow vest on and helping and moving people, giving directions. It felt amazing, man. I mean, I was in Iran when the revolution happened. And I know maybe that revolution now we would want to forget about it. But nevertheless, there was there was there was there was a smell and the essence of hope and freedom that pe- people felt. Mm. And this feels even that even more stronger because now we're all in it, you know. And um there was no social media back then so it was kind of like you know isolated situation that we felt it as iranians more than you know uh, western media and culture can i can i ask you about something that uh, i've been uh, talking about a little here and and you i'm sure will be able to reflect on this which is that i i'm i mean i had the same experience in toronto where i was in, i felt incredibly proud of the iranian canadian community uh, you know, I've been here for years, uh, active when there's demonstrations, protests uh, uh, with respect to the Iranian community. Never seen anything like this. Obviously, this is uh, um, a next level, more than fifty thousand. I don't, I don't think th- I think this sets a precedent in the world outside of Iran in terms of the numbers yes. we had. Some people saying fifty, sixty, seventy, hundred thousand people. Um, but there is a there is an uh, um, there's something in my gut that uh, is difficult as well, where I sort of think there's enthusiasm we feel on these demonstrations here in the diaspora. Uh, as you say, we're seeing brothers and sisters, we're getting that energy, we're going, look at this is happening, etc. cetera. Um, but we're not in Iran. And there's a delta between, I feel sometimes the enthusiasm that we that, that I'm experiencing here um, you know, there's there's a level of it that almost feels joyous. It's angry, et cetera, but it's like, look, we're here together. And, you know, what happened at Sharif last night, you know, uh, in Iran? I mean, people are, as we know, literally being killed. Um, there are crackdowns. There are, it's, it's, a, it's at a different level, and we don't know exactly where it's going from day to day. Do you feel that, that kind of tension in you? That, that That is for sure. Look, listen, there's no measure here. We're not talking about measure who's going to feel it a little bit more, a little bit less. We're, this, this is a root that we're all connected to. And of course, the kids on the ground that are doing uh, and, and taking the revenge of what's been happening for 40 years, is, is it's the front line. Absolutely. But to sit back and think that our actions and our spreading the news or our, our frustration, it means nothing then it leaves me so empty to think that. Then I'll get depressed and I don't want to do mm, anything. Mm, yeah, yeah. Okay, you well, know? well. look, the, the, the title of the episode is Where the Hell is the Western World? Um, and at this point, it's it's not just the media. I know you've been talking about this for a couple of weeks, as, as have I. Uh, I put out that post about the media a couple of weeks ago. Uh, now it's 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 beyond just the media as i've been saying it's 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 governments it's it's institutions it's western celebrities i, I know you're angry um t- tell us why from your perspective um i mean look 
uh, as a human being, forget about being Iranian, I've been involved in all movements that has been happening in the recent years. Uh, Me Too movements and, and uh, the Black Lives Matters. We stood by our brothers and sisters in America and we said, you can't do this. You know, we watched George Floyd and we were all like crazy and yeah. social media and outraged, right? A gay and lesbian and, you know, all that rights. And I, I want to know why we we're, we're less because we, 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 our color, we don't matter. Uh, it, it makes me really sad. Before anger is the sadness, the heavy sadness that is not being covered at all. I mean, come on. You, you put a little blurbs here and there to, to fill up your room and say, hey, you kind of like a liberal and talking about the subject. This is not that. This is people dying. This is genocide. I watched when Syria went to the genocide and we didn't do anything. So I'm not surprised, right? But the most important thing that I know in my heart that they need this government to be in place in Middle East, this Islamic Republic, so they could use it as a scarecrow. So they could point a finger and then they could sell arms. You think this you, you believe the Western governments are enabling the, the, the continued existence of the current regime in Iran? Absolutely. I mean, this negotiation even. Look, listen, does Iran have a right to have a nuclear, uh, a peaceful nuclear? Yes. If this was a different government, I would be marching on the street and say, yes, we deserve to have a nuclear energy and power. Like we had the treaties back in the 60s. Yes, let's go back to that. But not with this government letting the president of the country to come at the UN and, and talk. What does he has to say? His people on the streets, that he's killing his people. So I feel like, yes, we are enabling them. We are giving them a platform to be the bad guy of the Middle East. And they're scared of them now because now they have to deal with China. Now they have to deal with Russia. You know, we have covered Ukraine. We talked about Ukraine. And it should be talked about. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. awful what's happening. You, yeah, Ukraine's an interesting one because it's a case study that's from this year. Um, and uh, and and quite heartening in terms of the the way the world stood up and, and for for Ukraine and, and continues to I mean um, the American administration in a big way I'm yes. not sure I know Biden and Blinken have issued some statements but in your country I mean we've got our issues with whether the way the government's dealing with it here in Canada but what what would you like to see from the the president in in your country I mean in, in the, your country being the U S not America, your country of Iran yeah been here long enough i feel like that you know yes uh, i think biden uh, and, and his whole administration they have to stand really tall they have to stand like the way they're helping the ukrainians right now right what are they doing besides the filling up the media with it they're also giving them guns these kids on the street they're fighting with stones and pencils they don't have guns i think this thing they need to, I'm not saying, hey, let's send guns to Iran now out, out of nowhere, but I'm saying let's figure out the way, let's talk about it more. Let's hold them responsible for what's happening to these kids in the university. You're closing down the doors. If this would have happened in UCLA, hmm. Gian, if this would have happened in UCLA, uh, you know what kind of an outrage would that be yeah. anywhere in the yeah. world. But yeah. it's happening in Tehran, and it's okay. And uh, I listened to Bill Maher last night. Uh, talking to, I forgot her name, Massa, uh, Massa, yeah. And, yeah, and uh, uh, he's like, oh, well, you know, it, it doesn't look like that this government is going to go away or they're not going to give up. It's not about that. What about giving up? We're talking about uprising of people. We're talking about innocent people. This is a revolution and you're not covering us. We had a half a million people around the world showing up for this cause. So 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 let me let me ask you this. I mean, you 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 said that you think the the Western governments have an interest in enabling or keeping the regime there, um, and you're not alone. And a lot of people have said that. Um, w- w- does that explain? I mean, you know, media. You've been in the film industry, and you've been in PR. You've been, you've been you know you've had a successful career in various pursuits that involves media. Why why do you believe there is this silence? Look, the governments I, I are one thing. It. The governments are one thing. The, the big companies, whatever. I mean, where is you know where is I don't know Amazon. Where's where's Apple? But 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 tell me why you think the media isn't covering this. Look, I, these are personal opinions, and this is what I feel. And I'm not talking about conspiracy theories here, right? But uh, there is this war against Middle East within the media, 
and especially Middle Eastern men. As long as a white man in their mainstream film productions or media can look like a savior that is going to save a brown girl and they could look like a hero, we're good. Any other way, they need us to be in this position of angry, like Middle Easterns and Muslims and daddy, 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 daddy. Why? Because then they could turn around and line up their pockets by selling guns line up the pockets to have strategy around what happened in Afghanistan. We left them. We left them. What happened to I'm Kurdish, half Kurdish. What happened to the Kurds that they backed America for so many years and we left them just without any help? And so I feel like that, yes, uh, it's not even a feel. I see it. I, I felt it towards myself as an artist, as an actor, as a, you know, as someone who's creative in the media. I've seen it so many times saying, oh, he doesn't look like the terrorist. So that, that no, no, he's not Middle Eastern. They're looking for that look. They're looking for that sentiment so they could point your finger at us and say, you are the scarecrow of this region and we need you to stay in power. Well, I'm not sure I, if the, 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 the New York Times is not selling arms, though. But I, but I hear yeah. you. If what you're saying is, and I think this is what you're saying, you're saying that um, – it, 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 they have a certain narrative that helps sell, 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 get get clicks, and they don't have any. It, 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 there, there isn't enough it, um, incentive to change the narrative at this point and say, you know, let's help this Middle Eastern country. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. And also, they're scared right now because there's more than that, right? By having Iran in the region. It allows America and the rest of the world to do the things that they want to do in the name of fighting somehow some kind of strategy towards Iran. There is no more strategy. This is it. You want to help. This is the time. You want to actually get rid of this government who is like doing all these horrible things to these people around the world and terrorist acts. This is the time. And when are you going to do it? Obama made that mistake in 2008. I used to think of myself as a Democrat, right? But I've been so disappointed. Not that I'm jumping on the on the on the Republican side mm -hmm, right now. I'm mm -hmm. I'm sort of independent right now. But Obama made that mistake. He made that mistake with Iran. He made that mistake with Syria. We watch people getting killed, mm. and so uh, I, I I don't know. I, I that's where my anger and frustration is coming but from. But you know, if yes, if, if what you're saying is is I mean, even if what you were saying was twenty percent true, let alone entirely true, uh, it's pretty fucking damning you know in terms of the 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 millions of iranians in the diaspora who are stand-up citizens who are you know captains of industry who are bringing their brains bringing their abilities their hard work etc to being you know dutiful americans and canadians and and germans and 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 british and you know people around the world uh i i hear you it's like you know We've been here. We've been paying taxes. We've been, you know, why are why are we invisible? And and I think we always kind of hope that, or that we're not. But at a time like this, we realize, on some level, I mean, there's just no question, that, you know, what, what whatever people think the reason is, there's no question, as you say, if what was happening in Iran was happening in France right now, everybody yes. would be painting their their you know instagram handles with a french flag you know or That's or right. or marching in the streets here in Toronto. i mean you know and, and i'm talking about non-french folks right i mean so yeah. so uh let alone you know britain or the us or the ucla as you say all of that so um what, what tell me tell me before i let you go what um what is it that you're you're planning to do in the next uh um couple of days or, or, or what is your personal <laughs> decision around how you govern yourself at this moment at this point right now uh, to be honest with you Jean, I, all i want to do is that just basically the voice of what's happening in iran and trying to bring some attention to 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 our people and brothers and sisters on the ground and i, I find myself to be honest with you uh, out of 24 hours i'm finding myself over like 16 hours with frustrated and and sad and then there's the windows of hope that yes this could be the change and yes let's not give up and let's not stop like let's not stop this let's keep going we are very close to what needs to happen but um that's where i stand right now and, and I try to do and you know talk to you about it put it out there and and uh, and try to educate my non Iranian friends as much as I can Armin thanks for this take care of yourself in Los Angeles I appreciate this thank you so much bye bye sir. bye dear.
thought that never changes remains a stupid lie It's never been quite the same No hearing or breathing, no movement, no colour, just silence This is a Rook special edition, The Uprising, Where is the Western World? Let's go to Great Britain. Shirin Nasiri is an Iranian TV presenter, producer, jewelry designer, and social media influencer. You might know her from her years on Manoto TV. She has been very outspoken about the current uh, Iranian situation. And Shirin Nasiri joins me from London right now. Hello. Hi, Jian. It's good to see you again. Nice to see you again, always. So, I mean, I, you know, anyone who follows you or knows of you would know that you've been very active in the last uh, couple of weeks and uh, um, posting a lot on social media, spreading a lot of information, and and um, and at times quite emotionally. So, um, after this weekend, tell me how you're feeling. Uh, it's a very mixed kind of uh, feelings that I am feeling at the same time uh, it's like a, it's like a back and forth of hope anger sadness uh, desperate uh, but hope is always there luckily I have never felt this hopeful ever really? uh, in regards of uh, my mother land yeah why are you feeling so hopeful? Um, because um, I have seen probably two uh, protests in Iran, one of which is the uh, Hashta the Hasht one, uh, the Green Movement mm -hmm. era. Um, and I was involved in that. There is a braveness going on right now between everyone that I hadn't, I didn't see then. Mm. Uh, from close cl close circle of family and friends uh, to you know friends outside so in outer silk circles mm. um yes there is a braveness that i had not i did not see in neither myself nor other people yeah i've heard that actually from a few people my cousins who are say in their 30s and 40s saying that you know 20 years ago when they were the age of like some of these teenagers who are out there right now the high school students we see yesterday from the videos you know and today um that they am conning others like they didn't have there's no chance that they would be this yeah brave and this outspoken and that this new generation is really um uh i mean fed up and they've got the example on the internet of what they're seeing in the rest of the world and and they're really not backing down are they no um and the funny or the interesting point is that even now people don't have access to much um i don't know any weapons whatsoever uh however social media it's empowered everyone so much more compared to then um and i think just because during the past decade um yes the late the the, the last generation or the young generation was receiving so much information of what's going on in other countries and what their generation are doing right now uh they they saw more uh, than anyone else before mm -hmm. them i think that's why they are now much more aware of what they deserve and what normal life means you know yeah. what i mean i i was i want to get to the the uh where the world is where the media is etc but but i'd be remiss just when i have you here to not say i mean how do you how do you feel given conversations we've had in the past and, and what you've had to go through as a as an iranian woman who i know detested um you know uh, having to live under those rules and and left the country because of it uh, how, how do you feel when you see these these videos of of young women in in iran ripping off the the hijab the rusari and and um in the streets and in schools tell me how you feel about that i feel proud i feel jealous i feel uh, overwhelmed with all kinds of feelings i feel anger but as i say these are all because i am aware that 
this is a process and we have to trust the process and i am aware that there will be days that we will only hear bad things and nobody wants to see and hear these things but we can't avoid them however when i see that i'm like there's no, there's no going back and there are people who say who try to bring evidence as like this not this is the same as before <sighs> i just feel like even if these protests stop and if people start to go to back to their normal well normal in quotations uh life um the next one is not that far mm. yeah it'll never be the same feels like that no. definitely feels like that so let yeah. me ask you this like um you know you you surely have i saw your latest uh, video you were talking about the um lack of attention um to to iran um what do, what do you make of the the silence of of the world you're sitting in one of the the major media centers of the of the globe in london um and um we talked to nazanin ansari about this as well what 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 is your sense of why this seems to be off the agenda for for not just media but even global leaders hmm. in my opinion there are different things that we need to take in consideration uh Right just before uh, I came to start our conversation together, I was uh, watching Channel 4 News. Mm. They did cover it tonight, uh, cover the whole thing. They, they talked about Sharif University. They talked about the students, the girls in the school and all of that. Okay. Um, and I was happy about that, obviously, and then realized that New York Times changed their mistake and all of that. Um, what if which one yes, on uh, which, which mistake they posted, a post, <laughs> right. they posted a post and explained that this protest or uprising is about this 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 and didn't like oh because say, because oh, the problem right yeah well that's i mean the i checked it a couple of hours ago and it was still uh uh, yeah, there's some people who have a problem with the economy in Iran, which was I just didn't know where that came from. But okay, so they're 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 hearing some outcry, surely. Okay. So sometimes I'm like, okay, we are trying to raise awareness. We are trying to raise awareness. The Niagara waterfall has turned. To some extent, it's great, and I've been discussing and arguing with my friends in direct messages about this because I retweeted that picture and I said, so what. Hmm. Because I was angry last night when I read a tweet of a student from Sharif University who got back home and he was full of anger and hatred. Mm. He was like, you Kharijia outsiders or people who live outside yeah, yeah. are popping up champagnes uh, saying, oh, we are hopeful and we are dying here. And he was killing me. Yeah. So I said, so what about the Niagara, whatever? Uh, yes, but in my heart, I believe that the leaders can do something and they are not doing something. Mm -hmm. You make a great point about the, um, the kid who wrote you from the student who wrote or said something from Sharif University. I, that's something I've been talking about and, and concerned about. And I brought it up a couple of times today that, um, but that, that, that this weird, you know, yeah, we lit up Niagara Falls. I mean, I don't think it's necessary. It's relatively benign. I certainly don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, you know, but it, uh, but it does feel like nobody's won the World Cup here. You know, like we're trying to. In fact, there's people being killed on the streets. So sometimes the enthusiasm that we feel in the diaspora, that I think maybe is partly, honestly, fueled by just seeing so many other people and going, wow. Look at all these sisters and brothers who care about this thing, you know, like and that. And so we get excited, you know, but I, I do think that that can be disconnected from actually what's happening, you know, which is fucking horrifying. You know, it's not something to be um, uh, it, like it's inspiration. The bravery is inspirational, but but what's happening to a lot of these young people is not. right? No, not at all. And I felt ashamed when I was reading that. Uh, those tweets, I felt ashamed of being hopeful yesterday. Um, last night, I was in the Twitter space 
where we were all talking and trying to brainstorm about what to do to help uh, Sharif students. Uh, I was up until 2 a.m. Uh, and only when I, I could go to bed only when I heard someone from inside Iran, Tehran, that said uh, nobody's been killed, dead. Or, like I could get something mm. that calmed me down a little bit. Mm. Is that right? Do we know that nobody was killed in uh, at Sharif? Nothing uh, has come out that anyone has been killed. Uh, they were shot at. I heard. Well, they heard shots. But, they, uh, they, yeah, there have been a lot who were injured, but no, mm. that hopefully and presumably arrested and beaten up. But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. What you when you had those Twitter conversations? I mean, before I let you go, what 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 is it that you feel like you can? What way do you feel like you can most contribute um, in the next in the coming days? What I am trying to do and continue to do is uh, to use all of my social media platforms. I was selective of what to put on each one of them. LinkedIn and TikTok would be some of them. Uh, on LinkedIn, I never posted anything unrelated to work. Uh, but now this is all I am posting. And I say like, for example, with regards of this news, um, what are they called? News outlets. Uh, but I posted it on my LinkedIn and I said, colleagues, networks, peers, this is about professionalism. This is about mm. news people do not doing their job. And I asked everyone to tag them and stuff. But um, one other thing that I'm thinking is that I will definitely dedicate some of my time to coaching uh, women and men after the revolution for free from Iran. Hmm. Yeah. After the revolution, meaning this one? After the revolution. This, this revolution, you, yeah. You feel like it's a revolution right now? It's definitely a women's revolution, um, I think. that, that uh, this, this never happened in that region of the world. No question about that. It's historic. Shunjan, uh, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for this. Thank you, Jianjian. It was nice to see you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Shirin Nasri uh, in London. Um, let me just turn the microphones back on here with uh, Kubi Shaya, who's been patiently <laughs> getting all these guests, and Smart Pega. Okay. And by the way, our team, Roham and Paris out there, are working hard to... Uh, uh, people don't hear the other names here. They just hear you yeah. guys. Uh, <laughs> and so there's there's people working hard on this. Um, well, that was... Uh, um, I love... Can I say yeah. something? I, I love Mersad Bujardi. Mm -hmm. It was mm. really eye-opening for me. Really. How was it eye-opening? So, I mean... Um, I loved the conversation as well. Yeah. Mm. Like, you know, it, it's good that sometimes because uh, during these times the emotion is really high yes. and so we we usually lose our logic it's mm -hmm. important to uh, at some point we hear from some academics that mm -hmm. like remind us yeah. give uh, give us a bigger picture that he's not that old a guy but he felt he sounded like the <laughs> the adult in the room yes. <laughs> no disrespect to everybody yeah. else he was kind of like okay Yes. Everybody, calm down. I've studied revolutions. Here's where yeah. we're at, and yeah, yeah. yeah. He he uh, he he gives uh, he gives us a bigger map. You know that you are here. Like the next step is like mm -hmm. the uh, all the groups have to uh, has have to come involved and like. But I, I, again, I think my take is like emotion is good. It's important, but we have to contrary well uh it was good to get some different perspectives mm -hmm. i mean um because i think arash and uh armin and and i guess and nazanin as well they, they were like revolution mm -hmm. is happening <laughs> yeah. which is funny because i think that dr borgetti said distinctly said revolution is not happening right <laughs> <laughs> so so we have some disagreement um yeah. but yeah. i, I kind of want to believe the the revolution is happening but i also uh, you know, a lot of questions come up when you when you mm -hmm. assume that if if it is a revolution, w you know, we need a plan in place. When's that going to happen? Well, I thought it was interesting that that um, Dr. Berejiklian was was so focused on 
let's get our ducks in a row for the next mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. You know, we yes. the next one's coming. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought that was pretty wise, even if the next one's a month from now, you know, or, mm-hmm. or something. Yeah. But the presumption in there that this one ain't going to be the time and it's going to die off yeah. is kind of a common narrative right now. And... And uh, and it's being challenged by yes. others. Like Arash doesn't believe that. Yeah. Sounds like he thinks this could be a bigger moment than that. Mm-hmm. The, uh, so, so the other thing that I really like is like I I I I, I agree with him, and I'm I'm not no I'm nobody to mm. agree with Dr. Bruchard. But like putting shame on people, I I I think it's like it's not good. You know, it's like mm-hmm. a, it reminds me of like Islamic revolution that they put shame on people and yeah. they go on that's a tough one he's yes. saying right now he's saying we should be able to accept military who've worked with the regime mm-hmm. to if they repent and come and be sure, part of the revolution if you want to practice democracy we have to well that's a yeah it's a tough one yeah uh i also want to say what shireen just said about hearing from somebody who is involved in um, a cherry for you know some mm-hmm. fr- from inside Iran I think yeah. mm-hmm. who had sent the message out like uh, reacting to something like the Niagara Falls being the painted uh-huh. the, the Iranian flag color mm-hmm. and saying well thanks a lot but uh, you know uh, while you guys are popping the popping the corks on the champagne mm-hmm. we gotta uh, that really affected me yeah. I thought yeah. that was a, a really powerful point and I was gonna say going back to you know the emotion versus kind of the analytical view of things um when Armin Amiri was talking about um you know the way this has affected him and um the fact that his mother was from the same yeah. town and all of that I just at the top of that conversation I just for a moment I just felt like taking a deep breath and I, I just felt that in his voice yeah. and it just I don't know it just really hits you yeah and he's talking about a sense of history of mm-hmm. how this has been building up in him, and he's not alone. You know, think about someone like Nazanin, yeah. who's just spent. I mean, it, it's not like the rest of us haven't, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, he, she spent forty-three years, you know, uh, on the front lines of fighting mm-hmm. this thing, and she feels uh, an arash. Victory is near. I mean, everyone's feeling yeah. so um, inspired and hopeful, and at the same time. Yeah. Nervous and scared, and it's no wonder that people are not sleeping, right? This roller coaster of emotions, yeah. Yeah. honestly. But I, the, the thing that Dr. Berejiklian was saying that that he doesn't want people to be disappointed, mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. think, is is something I I continue to worry about. Yes. I know I've been saying that in different ways, and people don't like hearing it. Like when I kind of go, <laughs> oh, you know, they're like, "Come oh, fuck you, know, it's a revolution," you know. But I I am, I I I want this to be a long term, like this to happen. Mm-hmm. So I don't want. A bunch of people to throw their arms up in the air and go, "This can't happen," you know. And hopefully, that's yeah. that's not going to be the case. I mean, uh, certainly, the eighteen-year-old right now <laughs> in freaking you know Esfahan, who's yeah. he, is is not going to forget this. Yeah. Sure. No matter what happens. Yeah, I hope it's happening. On the note that Shirin said about champagne, it has also another side that was very heartwarming for me, like. The people inside Iran who shared the Toronto gathering picture, mm. and they said, "Like, see, we are not alone." And yes, you know, yeah. it was really yeah. heartwarming. And one of the things we learned uh, last week on our Thursday show was that the people in Iran, because we spoke to some mm-hmm. demonstrators uh, using pseudonyms, uh, 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 who are inside Iran, mm-hmm. and they were saying they are aware of what's happening around the world. Mm-hmm. They are aware of the support, and it means a lot to them. We are gonna, planning to do another one of those shows from Voices yeah. Inside. Iran uh, probably this Thursday so um, tune in for that thank you we know it was a long show we hope you made it to the end here Um, stay in touch with us info at rookmedia.com or post on our platforms thank you Shia thank you Pega Um, this is full time for this special edition of Rook episode number 203 our website for all things Rook related is rookmedia.com rookmedia.com thanks to the amazing team who put this show together savvy roham talented anahita will be good to have you back soon parisaw pega merdod and shia thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content please subscribe on any of our platforms if you haven't done so already find me on instagram at giangomeshi mizunbashi 